Hi, Christine. Hey, Vin. Oh. What did you do just now? <laughs> kind of- huh? I'm God. sorry. I didn't know I was on the set of Friday the 13th. <laughs> I dropped. <laughs> what did you drop? I dropped my shoe onto the mixer and it hit a button. <laughs> <laughs> I accidentally. <laughs> do you realize all my brain didn't know what to do with? Oh, that sound was because I dropped my shoe. I was like. What in the the little band that plays in their phone? <laughs> I have those fancy sketchers where when you walk, they light up and play like the X Files theme. Oh my god, you guys! Okay, here's the, here's the thing: we got these new mixers, and they're way too fancy. Like I don't understand what they are. They're just like they have all these buttons, and I don't know what they do. But clearly, now I know what one of them does. Um, and it's it that the shit out of me. I, my skin. I like left my body <laughs> my soul disappeared for a minute there oh my you gosh my mixer is all the way over here like i it's be I careful don't know what it's the dangerous should i press a random button yeah don't pre- i think the the bottom right one seemed to make that noise so pick a different one here pick a color Ooh. okay how about green <laughs> oh. did you hear anything yeah did you not hear that no what was it it went wah 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 <laughs> <laughs> well now i know exactly what to press Wait, when you that's talk. so weird i wonder why you couldn't hear it oh well it, i it, i'm the mixer settings i probably go straight to you i don't know but Great. now <laughs> i at least know the green one is a winner <laughs> so. oh my god i'm gonna stop dropping my shoes on things i guess um wow uh, that was alarming wow. anyway hi <laughs> good start hi. <laughs> how, how, how are you <laughs> oh my god well i brought um our special and that's why i drink wine glasses that are, i think are i don't know if they're for sale right now but whatever i have a special and that's why i drink wine glass and i have a box of wine um so it's Bota a box it's a boda box in cabernet it's a special day i'm gonna be drinking some wine how are you doing uh i'm i'm ugh, oh fine oh no <laughs> Uh, by the way, I'm drinking, uh, I was going to think of a funny way to say lemonade, but nothing. Oh, a funny be. way to say lemonade. That's a <laughs> let cool. Let me just, what a let me just do game. it now. Hang on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, damn. That's good. We should label these. So no, we shouldn't. We shouldn't. I shouldn't. I shouldn't <laughs> even touch the, them. The Christine button. I should. <laughs> um, so, uh, no, I'm, I'm going through it for no reason other than my own concocted anxieties because, uh, as of yesterday, we are a home of two people. Oh, and right. Allison moved out. It's you and RJ. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So during COVID, uh, RJ met a girl on oh. Tinder. Wah, and then wah, they. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> Just for everybody who had a crush on him, all the audience. I know. I know. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, they. They did like socially distance, like FaceTime COVID dating for like six months. And then they. It was so. Yeah, it was like a whole process because it was right during COVID. Yeah, I remember it was. I actually uh, Allison and I like to take credit for his. I'm sure you do. When we first, well, when COVID first started, every Friday we would turn the kitchen into like a like a bar. Oh, it was so cute. Happy hour. Happy hours. And so one particular night where Allison and RJ got a little too drunk (laughs) impossible all all of us ended up sitting around and like fixing each other's like profiles so like i did like we did allison's like bumble bff they did my bff and then we fixed up rj's tinder profile and a week later he met this girl i mean you're not wrong about that credit (laughs) and uh yeah so they started they hit it off and they are engaged for people who don't know they're engaged they're in gagged and <laughs> that's uh, what m calls it <laughs> <laughs> and yeah they found a new they found a place together and they moved out so we have this empty room now it's very weird it like echoes when you oh, walk oh how that. weird it's very weird so i am 
personally really just like taking it for the worst for no reason i'm very happy for them but i just i really just have a huge problem with change in general so that's where you and i differ my favorite thing is change i really i like what kind of gemini are you I don't know, but I do not take a big adjustments well, like life changes. And so he's been my roommate for like five years, five or six years. Aww. So it's just different. So I don't know what to do with his new room either. I well, It's probably going to become podcast an actual room. podcast room, which I've never had. Alpel works from home, right? So then you can both mm-hmm. have like your own spaces. That would be cool. Well, Allison and I also <laughs> made it made a deal where she was like uh if you pay the rent of that room you can do whatever you want oh with it. And I that's was like, smart <laughs> i was like okay so now i'm gonna like put my captain america shield up I'm gonna that's have a whole so bunch smart of you have up. that's that's true it can be like your man cave for the worst possible <laughs> cool. phrase ever Gross. i know my non-binary <laughs> hole no, <laughs> no. <laughs> be like a cave hole. your troll hole you just go <laughs> in there <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be so- <laughs> don't you wish you could go back to man cave i'm i'm just saying i gave you an out i hate that that's its name now it's too late i'm stroll it's too late oh, oh man well. i can't anyway, wait so, to, to visit anyway it. i'm overwhelmed by the possibilities of how I can make that room look because I can do whatever I want with it. It's my little troll. <laughs> Maybe I'll make Allison answer my riddles three before she ever <laughs> enters. She's um, not going to want to enter. I can guarantee you. <laughs> but yeah. So um, anyway, I'm taking it really hard that he's gone, even though like I am aware it's not about me at all, but I'm still finding a way to make it. Oh, about me that's, that, that's, there's the gem. That it's thing. finally tracks. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I did, by the way, I tried really hard not to like ruin their energy. I like have been kind of containing this to just me and Allison, but it was, it was really hard yesterday. Cause it was the first time Aww. where like he brought his, he brought his last stuff over to his new place and we like all took a selfie together as roommates That's and it was just hard. It was like, bye RJ. And he, like, he's not coming back. So it's just, it was weird to like, wait till he hears about the troll hole. Then he'll be back. <laughs> he's going to be like, I'm going to board it up. So nobody <laughs> can get in there. It's condemned now. <laughs> it's just, uh, it's no, it's just weird that, uh, like I didn't, I don't think I noticed how often he was on my mind when he lived here, but like there were certain times where I would think, oh, I hear a sound and I'm like, oh, it's RJ. And now I'm like, oh shit, what is it? Oh <laughs> so, no, you can't blame so. it on RJ anymore. I know. That's anyway, not to, you know, take over the last five minutes, but that's how I'm doing this week. Next week I'll be better. Okay. So. Well, we are, we are feeling for you. I think we've all been in similar, I don't know, the way I'm about changes, I'm like, over eager about it and i'm like yeah switch it up let's move let's buy a new house let's do this let's have a baby i mean you know you've witnessed it let's get married why not let's do it um but then like the day that like the thing ends or the thing happens it all hits me at once and i'm like why did i do like so when i moved out of my house in la i had like a mental breakdown um oh really oh yeah but but it all happened in that contained period and then you know i don't know a lot of energy and a hot 24 hours probably (laughs) Yeah, that's me. Um, anyway, oh, can I say one more thing to uh, why I drink this week? Yeah. Um, it's so not as important as yours, but it's just so on my mind. And I've, what? I've sort of harassed you via text message about it, but I'm starting a new fandom. And um, oh, okay. What? I don't know what you're getting it's to, called, and I don't like it. it <laughs> <laughs> you hear me and fandom, and you're like, oh, no, I shouldn't have brought up lemonade earlier. What is it? Um it's I'm a huge fan of a, a TV icon. His name's Chip Coffee. Oh God. <laughs> and all I can do is watch shows that he's on. It's my favorite thing. He's my new idol. Um I watched that for people who don't know who is Chip Coffee. <laughs> okay. So let me read you a thing, because he has before you ask everybody, uh his merch site is called the Coffee Shop. <laughs> and I was like, well, literally, what are you talking about? And I was like, I, th- I feel like I I feel like we all should know this already, but um, anyway, he wears a lot of scarves. He's a go. He's a pr- pr- uh, psychic medium, um, and he's on a lot of these shows. So I've been watching the show called Kindred Spirits on um, uh, Discovery Plus, and I've become absolutely obsessed with it. Um, and there's six seasons, so all I do is watch Kindred Spirits. Have you heard of that show? 
N- no, but I feel like I'm never going to be able to get away from it now. No, it's so good. Okay. And then the What's other. What's it about? It's these two um, paranormal investigators who go to like people's houses and help them like process what's going on and do a ghost hunt. But Oh, wow. Yeah, it's it's very cool. It's like they, it's it's a ghost show, but they're not, you know, screaming at ghosts and banging on shit. And like, <laughs> they're like dealing with families who are having, you know, weird shit going on at their house and so on. The the anti bagel bites. The anti bagel bites, if you will. And sometimes their good friend Chip Coffee comes along because he's a psychic medium and these two ghost hunters are not. And so he comes along and is like he will walk in with his scarf and he'll be like, It's low level demonic. And everyone's like, Oh no, <laughs> Chip said it's low level <laughs> demonic. Watch out. And one time he turned to the guy in the show, uh, Adam, and he was like he does not like you. And I was like, oh, shit. If Chip ever said that to me, I would probably cry. Um, but oh, he's... Wait, does he, does he, does, so he only shows up in some of the episodes. Do you watch every episode only hoping to find him? And then if like 15 minutes in, I was going to say, no. I was going to say, do you just go, never mind. No, because I didn't know he was on the show. I, so the, I discovered him originally when I watched, binged all of Psychic Kids when I was mm-hmm. pregnant and I got mm-hmm. obsessed with it. And he would come and help the kids because he was like, I was a kid when I discovered that I was a psychic medium. And so he, like, helps the kids process it and, like, helps figure out if they're just dealing with, like, mental health stuff or anxiety or if it's, like, really, you know, paranormal. And so when he showed up on this show, I was like, Chip, oh, my God, I've missed you. And now I've developed, like, a weird fandom that includes only my – I've tried to drag Evan and I was like, um, okay. (laughs) I – Okay, so here's the thing. I've never watched anything. I know, like for it's long it's enough like with a, him in it to understand. Yeah, but you're, I'm sure you're like the on the outside. The yeah, you're like you're on the outside, being like, I can't be a fan of something I don't know anything about, and I'm like, just do it. Just. Do I it. will say, I believe you that if I ever let myself have a big old swig of chip coffee, then <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh I, uh, I'm sure I would be just as enamored as you. I'm fully supportive of this fandom. He, this is much better than great. the weird mummified lemon you found under a bed all those years ago. <laughs> mummified lemon who? I'm just kidding. Lemon is still number one. Don't worry. Um, anyway, so... Oh, I know who lemon is. Ooh, you're drinking Uh-oh. him. He's going away by the end of the episode. <laughs> oh, okay. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Um, if anyone, like, gets it, you know, gets the fandom or is it a part of it, let me know because I would love As to be. As TikTok says, the girls who get it, the get girls it. who get it, get it. And um, I can't wait for M to be one of the girls who get it. <laughs> so we'll see. I'm going to be his little chocolate chip or is it a coffee bean? Which which one are we oh, doing here? Okay. Java chip. Does that work? Oh, I love that. We'll work a mocha on chip? A mocha chip. Mmm. Frappuccino. I don't know. We'll see how this we'll see how this goes. Chip, are you there? Do you want to give your opinion? He's like, no, I'm not involved. Thank you. <laughs> he's he like, takes this... he's like, I am a psychic, but I'm turning it off for <laughs> this moment. I don't want to hear you wherever down. you are. <laughs> Anyway, we've been talking for a hot 15 minutes and I'm here to to talk even longer. But now you have to stop talking so I can do it. No. You're going to like this one, I think, Christine. I'll I'll drink. This is um, hmm, not. It's not a it's it's one of those stories where it's more fungicational than an actual story. It's more like a history class. Oh, cool. Okay, (laughs) relax. You better fucking fake it. You're not good at selling it. You got to be like. Professor I've never M. been able to I've never been able to sell it, but we all end up in the right spot at the end. Okay, so this is the informational episode of the history of the Ouija board. Okay. Why did you just why did you make it sound so weird and like dry? I think I, I, think I do the insecure thing where I like really dumb it you down so no one's disappointed it. later. Yeah, I don't but know. But then you're just gonna like People who are like, eh, I don't feel like an info episode are just going to tune out, not knowing they're missing a Ouija board episode. Are you kidding me? Well, if they already tuned out, it's too late for them. This so. is amazing. Oops. I cannot wait. Now I'm really they've amped. already They've already skipped to your side, so sorry. Okay, here is... When mine starts, I'm going to go, all right, I know. I know who you are. Go back. Don't. <laughs> you're not fooling anyone. Okay, so we've got a lot of stuff to cover today. Um, first of all, I want to give a shout out to a man... Named Chip Robert. Coffee. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Robert uh, Chip, as he calls himself. <laughs> uh, shout out to Robert Merch. Okay. Who is, uh, I think he created the 
Talking Board Historical Society. That's which fun. why are we not a part of that? I don't know, but I want to be. Um, he can, he calls himself the chairman of the board, which I love that he gives himself this title. Get I, it? Chairman of the board? Oh. <gasps> I thought you already got it. I was like, holy shit, that's... <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I want to find the clapping one, but I don't want to hit all the buttons because I don't know what's going to happen. But that is excellent. Chairman of the board. That's so funny. Okay. Robert Murch can stay. Um, (laughs) But so I guess he's like the household name, as you know him, for the uh, he's like the biggest historian of Ouija board history. Wow. Um, And he started back in 92. So he's been researching for as long as I've been alive. Nice. And. Uh, before him though, there wasn't really a lot of like clear, uh, well thought out timelines about this history. So I got to give it up to Robert Murch. He got it all consolidated for consolidating. Cool. All right. Oh my God. My glasses. What was wrong with me? This is how I feel a million years old when I have to take my headphones off. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Leave me alone. So, uh, yes, he's also been a consultant on movies that I guess are Ouija themed, like a lot of horror movies. Mm. Um, and he went to the, I think the 2015, because I didn't see one that exists other than the 2015 one. He went to WeijaCon in 2015, Ooh. which I think was, I think it was a one-time only event because I looked it up and every single article said 2015. So I think it was like an anniversary event. All right. Someday. Let us know, guys, if it's back. If it's back, I'd love to go to WeijaCon. Me too. So here is the history. Do you want to take a whack at what year... The Ouija oh. board came to uh mm, Okay. Well, I'm thinking it was during spiritualism, unless that's like a different thing. Like a, a spirit board is different than a Ouija board. I don't know. But I guess maybe 1932. Okay. You were wrong. Cl- wrong. You were at first very close and then and not very close. And then but I don't it, know when spiritualism is. So no. Is that you, what oh, I, you If you had not said anything, I would have not known because i you remember there were two waves of spiritualism and the 1930s were <gasps> okay up that's on the what, second wave that's what i thought and i was like I, I didn't know if there was an earlier one okay so it was earlier 1886 yeah. actually what's so fucking weird is 1886 is <laughs> the year no it's not <laughs> that's very weird okay eh, eh. i've been practicing this is not a joke i've been practicing my psychic abilities i don't know why but i've been working why would did chip coffee tell you to do that no but i just want to impress him you know and i'm trying really hard <laughs> i hope he listened to only the last 20 seconds and he's blown away <laughs> me too okay. somebody sent him that clip only <laughs> <laughs> get rid of the part where christine doesn't know when spirit yeah <laughs> nobody needs to know about that so you are right, 1886, but we're going to go before that really quickly, and then we'll come back to that year. Okay, cool. So 1848 was the beginning of the first wave of spiritualism in the U.S. Okay. Um, and this was thanks to the Fox Sisters, mm-hmm. which was episode 201, um, if you want to go listen to that. But basically, they were these two sisters in upstate New York, and they uh, seemingly were capable of conjuring spirits and doing table wraps and they like toured the town <laughs> i think is what it was or was <laughs> that the, the town <laughs> the tour toured all of upstate new york they toured uh yeah I think they, yeah i think they toured right or they i mean, might be thinking of the davenport brothers they were so i think similar. they both did i think the fox sisters did if i remember i know the davenport brothers came like 60 years later so i oh just, okay so i'm I not had, positive but, but the Fox, the Fox sisters basically did the same thing in right. my memory. <laughs> so right. uh, they kind of blew everyone away. And that was the beginning of spiritualism taking the U.S. by storm and their celebrity for being spiritually inclined or mm-hmm. at least creeping people out. <laughs> uh, it fast tracked the concept of communicating with the dead and at a very prominent time, because around this time, the average lifespan wasn't even 50 years. Oh, my the people were dying real quick. Okay, and but so- do you know why that? Okay, sorry, I don't mean to be a be like a well, actually. But did the you teacher's know, pet? But why? <laughs> since you're the teacher right now, it's a good thing, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. What happened? Why? why? So uh, I was going to say disease, and so the reason that um, a lifespan is listed as being short is not because people were dying younger. It's because so many inf- so many people died in infancy that it lowers mm. the average. So it's not necessarily that people were only living to be like 50. It's that like 
people were living a, a longer life, but the right. So all the people who died as children or infants dragged down, down the average. Interesting. So I don't know. I learned that somewhere probably on TikTok. <laughs> hey, you know what? I'll take it. So the because I I was going to say the lifespan wasn't even fifty years. A lot of it was that children were dying at childbirth, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so were a lot of women dying. That's true that too. Childbirth. Yeah, that's true. Um, also disease and 15 years later was the civil war. Right. Okay. So wow. People were unfortunately dropping like flies. And yeah. especially after the civil war, people wanted to hear from their sons, right. their brothers, their dads, their cousins. Um, and a lot of people, they just never saw their body again and just wanted to make contact with them oh. or hear they were doing okay. Um, but so that was where spiritualism kind of stemmed from, right. but Despite the ability to potentially talk to the dead through spiritualism or having mediums or using some sort of, you know, Fox Sisters-esque tool of using like cabinets or table turning. Despite having all of that, people were still getting frustrated at how slow these ways of communication with the dead were, which I love <laughs> that even in the 1800s, really? people needed like instant gratification. Right. They didn't even have instant messaging yet, but they were like, this is too <laughs> slow to talk to my ghost friend. Right. Well, so for example, with table turning, uh, you had to like call out every letter of the alphabet until oh. eventually there was like a knock on the table. And it was like, that was an and M. So, and then I was like, I forget the last one. Start over. Like you know, exactly. <laughs> that would be such a so pain. Then, so yeah, it became a whole thing where like you couldn't even answer or like taking or getting full intimate messages from people took for fucking ever. Right. And so um, it just was not very efficient and it was very tedious and people would stop being kind of like stimulated by it halfway through. And right. especially in my mind, if I had, if like, cause at the time spiritualism, it wasn't like a spooky thing. It was a very well right. respected situation. And so I imagine if I thought I just always had access to being able to talk to my dead parent, if they were taking too long to spell right. something out, I'd be like, oh, I'll do this tomorrow. I'm late like, for I, dinner. Yeah, that's such yeah. a good point. It's like, this is something I had to start over tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So a more efficient system uh, would have been a huge seller in the rapidly growing spiritualist oh. community. Um, and basically, this all comes down to people wanting to capitalize on spiritualists. Okay. Yay. Love it. So the first Ouija board that... I could find there was only one source that mentioned this. So I'm unsure how true this is, but it's the earliest version I could find of like the Ouija board origin mm -hmm. was in 1853. Oh, so uh, that was what, like five, six years later. Yeah. Uh, once spiritualism started happening uh, in the U S at least. So to make things go faster in terms of communicating with the dead, there was in 1853, a spirit, probably a medium uh, but there was a spirit during a seance saying uh you should put down a pencil inside of a basket like take a basket turn it upside down and put a pencil through it and then you can guide the basket <gasps> and the pencil will basically it was like almost like a planchette meets automatic writing right okay that's interesting if that so i don't yeah, know if yeah. i just Describe that well enough for other people to understand. But, but basically, like it, it writes was, a letter out while you're, yeah, moving the pencil. Basically, consider the basket a planchette, but a pencil through it so it could draw. Got it. Um, so, and I, I say it was a spirit who suggested that. It was also, at the time, it could have been like a medium or a fraud pretending to be a medium who was like, oh, right. the spirit's saying we should do this. <laughs> so that's, anyway, that's the earliest origin I could find. Also, fun fact, in 1853, the same year, um, spiritualism was so big that like media was covering spiritualism and to a point where music was being made about spiritualism. Really? Um, there's a song in, in from 1853 called spirit rappings. Ooh, it was a rap. That would have been hysterical <laughs> if it were a rap, but no, it was about like table rappings, Damn. but, um, <laughs> I will, I don't know if you want to listen to it or if we can insert some of it. I absolutely want to listen to it and we should insert it. Okay, I'm going to send it to Geo's trio. Okay. Um, this is definitely a, a modern, a person singing the music today. Like, this is not like... Oh, I see. It's an original. When I think of, yeah, when I think of 1853, I would imagine like phonograph yeah. <laughs> music. This is clearly someone took the music sheet and performed it, but I couldn't find any 1850s music. Okay. I don't think they could record things back then. 
Spirit you don't have to wrappings. L- Okay. You don't have to listen to all of it if you don't want to, but it's only a minute long, so. Okay, I'm going to play it here. We got it. <laughs> can you, you can't hear it from my... I, I can hear it. You can? Softly, softly hear the rustle of the spirit's airy wings. They are coming down to mingle once again with earthly things. They're rapping and they're tapping. Tap, 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 do we go napping? <laughs> tap, 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 lost friends on me. Tap, Aww. tap, tap, they see and hear you. Wow, um, that's something. <laughs> Stop. Rap tap tap, good friends are. Or wait, dead friends are near you. Rap tap tap, they see and hear you. <laughs> it's I. I mean, in my mind, in the 1850s, there wasn't a lot of music out there um, compared to today. So I feel like uh, I feel like you could have done anything, and it would have been considered new. So my Spotify Wrapped would have been like. Number one hit. You are in the point oh one percent of top listeners. <laughs> rap. It would have been tap. your <laughs> Spotify rap. Oh, wait, I'm so stupid. I didn't even think that <laughs> Spotify wrapped. Anyway, I don't know if we're allowed to use all that or if we. I don't know what it was. I but think that probably the Creative Commons license is like is is enacted expired. now. Yeah, I feel like I feel like there's not really any. I mean, I could be wrong, but I feel like we were probably okay. Uh, all I know is that was some 1853 music for you hot off the press. So <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it. So uh, that was all up until basically it was spiritualist uh, spiritualism becoming more and more popular. And then um, uh, the first kind of evidence we have of this basket upside down planchette thing. Right. And people getting bored and looking for more efficient ways to talk to the dead. So now comes in your big year, 1886. Uh, who knew? And the people most consider this to be the year that is the beginning of Ouija boards. At least as now that Robert Murch has done enough research, this is the farthest back we can officially go and say 1886 was the year. That is weird that I just kind of said that. And <laughs> It's almost like they were rap tap tapping in your little head there. In my little is... brain. <laughs> <laughs> so in 1886, the Associated Press put out an article um, about, uh, I guess, in northern Ohio at the time, mm. there were some spiritualist camps in that area. And the Associated Press put out this article that the camps up there had this new mystical creation that was just sweeping the town <laughs> um and it was this new craze called a talking board Ooh. more or less a ouija board by the way just before anyone's waiting for the answer i really couldn't find the difference between a talking board spirit board or ouija board except that um ouija board is like a trademark right. name and for the most part they're all spirit boards and ouija board is it's, just so it's like spirit tissue board. and kleenex mm-hmm. okay yep cool so uh so this does mean that before 1886, there were some sort of spirit board in Ohio. But we just don't know who created the first official one. But okay. we know that they were in spiritualist camps at the time. All right. So uh, one person who read this article about these camps happened to be in Baltimore at the time. And this was a merchant named Charles Kennard. Hmm. And he claims that he, between reading this article... Or we we assume at the time that this article came out and he read it and this is what inspired him. But he ended up going home. He sat at his kitchen table with a cup of tea. And you know how when tea's moving around in the cup, your hand kind of moves with it. Mm-hmm. So he was holding a cup of tea over his table. I think it was over like a breadboard or something on his counter. And he realized that his hand was moving without him being in control of it. And uh-huh. so you mix that with the article he probably read and oh. it, he had this epiphany of like he can make his own talking boards in Baltimore. Interesting. 
So not knowing how to actually make it, which is silly because it's a board. Um, <laughs> it's, even I could fucking make that. Um, but okay. He was not the most skilled carpenter. Um, he asked the guy that worked next door to him to make some of these talking boards for him to sell. So the guy next door, his name was E.C. Reish. And he was kind of a uh, perfect for the job for making a bunch of wooden boards because he was a cabinet maker, a furniture maker, and eventually just became solely a coffin maker. Oh, my. So it's interesting that a coffin maker yeah. made the prototypes for a Ouija board. It is. Spooky ooky. Uh-huh. So, yeah. So uh, Charles Kennard came up with this idea or really ripped it off from these spiritualist camps in Ohio. <laughs> and then he went to his next door coffin maker and was like, can you make a couple <laughs> prototypes of this? <laughs> so as of 1890, so four years later, in 1890, Charles Kennard had some investors backing him and he uh, started the Kennard Novelty Company. Wow. Um, and it was the first manufacturer of Ouija boards. He really went for it. He really went for it. And also this like poor coffin maker who made the prototypes and probably did not get a cut. Um, but okay. You better have. That's terrible. It, this, every article I read about Charles Kennard, it felt like he was a little slimy. So, mm. I mean, he also like literally took the idea from someone in Ohio. And, right. Like, you know. It's mine now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I came up with it. So, <laughs> so question, mm -hmm. do you know where the name Ouija comes from? Yes, I believe so. I believe it's the French and the German for yes combined. So you is that, are. Is that a like a is that like a false thing? It is a false, but the most popular thing. Oh, so interesting. You, OK, then I don't know. So that is the uh, mass majority's understanding of where Ouija comes from, that it's the French. Yes. And the German yes put together. So it's a yes, yes board, which it, is interesting <laughs> because there is not a yes, yes option. Only yes, no. <laughs> So um, what is it? So it should be technically a we nine board. Okay, I know? was going to say that, but I'm so <laughs> glad you said it. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. I, I know one word in German. Um, <laughs> That's a good one. Okay, so the reason why it's called the Ouija board is so Charles Kennard in 1890, he created the Kennard Novelty Company, and it was the first manufacturers of Ouija boards. Mm -hmm. To have their, to get their name cooking though, and to like get a copyright and have the patent for it. Uh, they decided that they were going to go to a patent office and he was going to go with his attorney who was also one of his investors. Mm -hmm. Um, so this co-investor slash attorney of Charles Kennard's, his name was Elijah Bond and his sister, Helen Peters came with them to the patent office okay. and she came, she came to the patent office with them. Because Elijah Bond said, oh, my sister's a medium. Ooh. So it might be useful to have her there when we're trying to get the patent for this spirit board. Okay. Um, by the way, this was April 1890. And I think that some people think it's probably April 25th, 1890, the day that they got the, that they went and uh, looked for the patent. Okay. So it was Charles Kennard. I think he was there. At least uh, his attorney, Elijah Bond, and his sister, Helen, went to the patent office. Okay. And they, again, decided to use Helen uh, because she was a, uh, a medium, and they had her use the board to show the patent officer how it worked. Okay. Interesting. And I guess it also probably made it look good. They're like, oh, a medium is backing us on this, that it works. Right. I don't know. Um, so... Oh, I'm sorry. This is uh, this is before the patent. Actually, I'm sorry. This is not. This is not the patent office. They just happen to all be together with the Ouija board, and they're going to go get a patent uh, after okay. this. I'm okay. sorry. Okay. Sorry. 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 I just totally threw everyone off. Um. Okay. So April 1890. Uh, don't Charles send Kenner chip. Don't send chip coffee. This part. <laughs> I know. I've just everyone erase everything I've said up until uh, we nine. Every then everything. <laughs> <laughs> I've erased your memories. <laughs> okay. So April 25th-ish, yeah. 1890. Charles uh, Kennard was using the prototype with his co-investor slash attorney, Elijah Bond, right. and his sister, Helen Peters. Okay. Um, when they were all using it together, I think they were practicing for getting the patent. Right. They were and like so, prepping their case or whatever. Yes. Okay. So uh, 
they were using the board and they were like, oh, we don't actually have a name for this yet. What are we going to call it when we try to get it licensed? Mm -hmm. And uh, they said, oh, well, we might as well ask the board what we should Uh call it. So they had Ellen use the board and ask what it should be called, and they got the word Ouija. What? And when asked what it meant, the board spelled out good luck. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, That's funny. That's a a good sense of humor. Here's a fun fact for you, though. Suspiciously, okay, the board could have named itself Ouija out of nowhere, Mm -hmm. but... Helen, who was the one using the board and was the medium, so she was the most trusted. She happened to be a big fan of Marie Louise Rame, who at the time was a famous author and activist whose nickname was We Duh with a D instead of a J. No way. In fact, in fact, on this night, Helen was wearing a locket with <gasps> Weda's portrait in it and her name, Weda, written on top of the picture, which feels a little homosexual. I feel like I'm feeling like there was yeah. like a, maybe a little love thing going on there. Like, I don't know. Tribute. Maybe they I mean, I don't know anyone who's carrying a locket of like someone they admire for no reason. If someone has a know. locket of M, please tell me because I need <laughs> I must know. It just it feels a little it feels a little. And like, I kind of, I want it to be. That's the problem. I'm projecting a hundred percent. That's the problem. No, I get it. It's like, it feels weird to put, I mean, but I guess it was also different times. Like, I don't know. It was different times. I could be totally wrong. All I know is if I met someone today who was carrying around a locket of someone they didn't know, I'd be like, what's that about? Like, oh, you must have some strong, (laughs) passionate feelings for that person. Really, really interested i don't know i could totally i'm just being an asshole i'm sorry but i just no it's an interesting point and also to like have that so on the brain that you're like i will name this new project after this person so we duh was it spelled so it was spelled the same but with a d okay so we don't know if maybe the locket like the handwriting was just fast and it looked like a j or something or maybe maybe for all we know helen who was using the board was trying very hard to actually not influence the board and like Mm. part of it just came out and the other part didn't i don't know but it's interesting it's very like what are the odds that yeah only one letter off would unless be the, the ghost name. was like hmm this is a lot of pressure let me look around the room like crentist you know like <laughs> um oh i see a word on your locket let me write that out <laughs> I mean, honestly like, so here's what i think i i mean i don't know what's true or not maybe it was we duh who was the one channeling the board and like slipped oh, on the letter or something interesting I but i do like the idea of helen secretly using this opportunity to either name the board after like this activist uh-huh like make it like a little feminist moment mm-hmm. or i don't know maybe she wanted to name the board after someone she had a crush on i don't know 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 em doesn't but know but em really wants to believe so i want to believe so bad <laughs> it would just it remind. i don't know why but i'm it gives it gives like an emily dickinson kind of vibe because I, I don't know why i don't know Anyway, sorry for making so many assumptions unnecessary. Um, It wouldn't be the first time we've done that, so it's okay. I I know. Uh, Another fun fact is that the location that this happened at, where the Ouija board was officially named, was at 529 North Charles Street, which is now a 7-Eleven with a plaque on the wall. They're very, very proud of this. I took a, I didn't take a picture. I did not go to Baltimore, but <laughs> I, I am sending you a picture of the plaque on the wall. Shut up. Okay. So when we go to Baltimore, we got to find this. <laughs> we just have to go to 7-Eleven. I will buy a Dr. Pepper here and we will take a photo. <laughs> <laughs> Ouija was named here. That is It looks so like cool. a bathroom wall. So I'm kind of wondering if this is in someone's bathroom. M, it absolutely looks like the 7-Eleven bathroom. You're <laughs> right? completely right. Anyway. Wow. I, that is fun. Fun fact. So anyway, now they have officially named the board and now they're going to the patent office and Elijah and Helen are going with them. Okay. So uh, they basically knew going into this, this wasn't, uh, by the way, Elijah's like first time going to a patent office. I think he did a lot of patent law stuff in Baltimore. (laughs) Um, He knew that he wasn't going to be able to get a patent for this unless he could prove to the patent officer that the Ouija board actually worked. (laughs) Okay. And so that's why he also decided to bring Helen 
Uh huh. Um, uh huh. So, as expected, the patent officer wouldn't let them continue paperwork until Elijah and Helen could prove that the Ouija board should even be taken seriously. Okay. So the patent officer basically said, if it can spell out my name, then I'll give you a patent. Okay. Okay. I know. I know. I know. I was in my head. I'm like, that's an easy win. Like, mm-hmm. that's pretty- I can do that. Yeah. Uh, I oh, wait. Know, like, maybe-, maybe they didn't know his name. That's what I'm thinking. Like, oh, but- maybe they didn't know his first name or something. But also, wouldn't you think, like, if you're going into someone's office, how do you address them if you don't know their Maybe name? it's, like, Mr. Fredrickson, but, like, you don't know his first name? I don't know. You're right. I don't you're know. right. It doesn't really make sense. Yeah. Or I'm trying to think, like, what if maybe his name was hard to spell and they spelled it correctly? He's like, my know. name is Brayley, but not the way that you would usually think it's spelled Brayley. Mm. It has a couple <laughs> of a accents s- and some vowels. <laughs> silent M. Uh, <laughs> my name is Willem Dafoe. Go crazy. <laughs> Uh, so sure enough, they were able to spell out his name. I don't know if they secretly knew his name or it was not that hard or they, <laughs> maybe this guy was confused on how the board works. I was going to say, maybe he's just easily impressed. Who knows? That's the one time you absolutely fake the Ouija board working. You're just like, okay. fucking literally You're like, go step aside. We, we got to take <laughs> care of this one ourselves. Sure enough, they ended up getting the patent, and that was on February 10th, 1891. And for those that care, the patent number for a Ouija board, or the Ouija board, is 446054. Oh, I, I weirdly care. I don't know why, but I do. There you go. And the first location to actually make Ouija boards was uh, is now a Wells Fargo on St. Paul Street, in case you care about that. With a plaque in the bathroom? No plaque. Damn it. I know. Hmm. Y'all, if you're... Wells Fargo, if you're listening and you get a plaque, I will get your shit together. Um, Wells Fargo out with you. Yeah. Um, interestingly, the patent offered no details on how the board actually worked, which I guess is what <laughs> makes it extra spooky. Okay. Like yeah. you needed it to work for them to fill out the paperwork, but you're not going to write about how it works. Yeah. You're just like, figure it out yourself. I get good luck as a ghost said, I guess. So, uh, in the same month that the Ouija board got its patent, they wasted no time and there were immediately ads starting to come out in newspapers. Wow. So the first one that I could see, the first ad was in Pittsburgh and this was 1891 and it was called Ouija, the wonderful talking board. And it How cost fun. $1.50. Oh gosh. Did you, Which, do you ever remember buying your first Ouija board? I say I your do. first as if it were like... But my f- my first I I do think I actually had a few at different times because I think my dad probably my kept stepdad them kept away. throwing them away yeah I had multiple for that reason um, it was for my tenth birthday party because you, I feel like this is like probably gross or cringy now but at the time for my tenth it was my tenth birthday or my eleventh birthday um, it was a Harry Potter party oh. and I think because magic and spookiness i right, think my right. mom was like oh well obviously we'll play with a ouija board at the end uh, i don't really know how great. She, <laughs> i don't know how she clicked those two things together but i remember uh it i didn't even really i remember ha- having to go to like three different places until we could find one because at the time target didn't sell them well target still doesn't sell them because remember i had to make my own on the back of one of our posters that's right i mean i didn't that's have right. to do anything but i made one on the back of our posters and used a <laughs> wine glass as a planchette um, I bought my first, well, I had a wage board and then my stepdad threw it away. Then I went to New York city with my dad and stepmom and I bought one, my <clears throat> mom and, or my dad's stepmom gave me $20 to spend at FAO Schwartz and I bought myself a Ouija board. <laughs> Honestly, I love that. Uh, I, I remember ha- like it was my first like real sleepover party. So I remember some people being truly freaked out. Oh yeah. And thinking nobody ever like, wanted remember- to play with me. Uh, Interesting that I think, it still happens. I think all of us that didn't know what it was was excited to play. And then someone, mm-hmm. one of my friends had like heard of one before and was told to never touch it. And so she freaked out and like sat upstairs while we played. And I was like, okay, loser. <laughs> oh, no. And then, I, and then I ended up, I don't know. But uh, yeah, I only played that one time in my basement. And then I think any other time I played with one, I it was never really in my own home. Man, well. We let it. By the way, childhood. I looked it up <clears throat> and it was a dollar fifty at the time. Yeah. Um in 1891, that was the equivalent to about $45. Whoa. Yeah. I was like, wow, how cheap. Because mine was like 20 some bucks. 
Nope. Wow, that's expensive. Okay. But I guess it wasn't for kids, right? It wasn't like, oh, it's Hasbro. It was a tool. It, it was, was an like instrument. an actual spiritualist tool. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. That's a, This is according to in 2013 dollars.com. So <laughs> I don't know if that means as website. a favorite <laughs> website. $1, $1 and 50 cents. In 2013 dollars.com. Yeah. Today it would be worth 46 bucks. So. Wow. So, okay. So, but yeah, that makes, I mean, that makes sense that it was an instrument or a spiritual tool at the time. Right. Uh, but so I also appreciated that some of the ads were like very vague. They were like the, the Ouija wonderful talking board. It's interesting. <laughs> it's, it's like, yeah, well, it's like when true. people ask me like, what's your podcast about? I'm like, oh, I don't <laughs> think I should tell you. You don't seem like you want to know the truth. It's pretty oh, interesting. Who did that happen to be to? I feel like that sentence doesn't make sense. I feel like I just told someone that I have a podcast. That happens every time I get Remicade and the nurses are like so kind and they're like, tell me about your show. And I'm like, I'm stuck here for four. You're stuck with me for the next five hours. I don't think you want to know about this. Well, also now I feel like everyone has a podcast. And right. so it's so I, weird to say. Yeah. It's so weird to say I have a podcast because now that. I mean, I feel like every single person is like, let's just get a microphone and start a podcast, which, by the way, I fully support. Which is but a good thing. That's because, what we did. Right. But because there's so many of them, it's like now be, it's almost it's like just a cliche. It's almost like devolving into uh, a reputation for being a hobby versus a job. In Absolutely. My mind. Yeah. I feel like there was a moment there. It wasn't forever, but there was a moment where I could say like, oh, I'm a podcaster. And it sounded like that was my real job. And <laughs> now when I say I'm a podcaster, I feel like everyone's got one. And so people have to be like, oh, well, what else what, do you do? What do you do, like, though? <gasps> but I will say, yeah, yeah. Um, try being in Kentucky because you're like, I'm a podcaster. And people are like, oh, what? And I'm like, and they're like, where's your where's your husband? <laughs> Can I talk to your husband? That's not quite how it goes. But in my head, that's what where's happens. Your husband? We need to we need him to bring you to the nearest asylum. <laughs> <laughs> you're having well. woman problems. We need to put you away. <laughs> no, 100 percent. It, it feels very like I'm like, uh, but I always couch it with which is so douchey. But I do it just like out of my own self-defense. I'm like, oh, I moved uh, here from L.A. recently. I work as a podcast producer. That's how I phrase it, because I'm like too embarrassed. I don't know. It's I do the insecurity. same thing. I never know how to. Sometimes I'll just straight up say that, like, it's not even true. I'm just, I'm just blatantly lying to people. But I don't know how else to get out of it. And so I'll just say, like, oh, I am a comedian, which is ironic because I'm not. I don't think I'm that. <laughs> I'm not. I don't think you that. say it with such <laughs> non confidence. I, I just say like, I, I like. How else do I say I'm a talker? Like for but the worst <laughs> thing about saying you're a comedian is they're like, tell me a joke immediately, and well, I'm like, well, then I also no. one time. Because I was with people my mom's age, and I've heard my mom do it, so I was like, okay, maybe I can pull it off. I just like to avoid the whole "what's a podcast" conversation. I just said I I did a radio show, and then people thought I was like on local radio, and then they were asked. I was it was mornings with M on KT four X. Yeah, just, I really psyched myself out every time. So I, now I just don't know what to it say. It never so. ends well. <laughs> it never ends smoothly. I'm with you. I do the same. It never thing. ends smoothly. Yeah. Uh, anyway, sorry folks for all that, but the, just how our life goes every day. <laughs> um, okay. So the first ads came out in 1891 for a dollar 50. And within the first year of putting them out, the Kenner novelty company expanded to seven different locations Holy and shit. soon 2000 boards were being sold weekly. Holy shit. So it came at the perfect time. They were like, this is right after the war and or, was it right after the war? No, it was not right after the war, but it was like, you know, spiritualism was up and out rampant so they were like we got them right right at the sweet spot yeah so uh another fun fact is at the same time that they were selling ouija boards kennard and other companies tried to make other similar boards at the time called the volo and the igali oh, i-g-i-l-i oh. okay Neither of them sold as well. By the way. <laughs> um, they also had some other people i guess try to do um similar boards if you look at them they're all more or less the exact same thing except the letters are in different places oh so, okay in 1893 probably thanks to the creation of the ouija board perpetuating so much interest um at least a, a portion of the thanks probably has to go to the ouija board in 1893 spiritualism grows even more popular and is deemed an official religion what okay and the we and the ouija board only started selling two years before wow okay um 
in that same year, Kennard and his investors all basically pull out. I think they were like, let's get out while it's hot. And they hand the company to one of their employees named William Fold. Okay. So William Fold carries on the Ouija brand. Uh, despite his obituary, folks, uh, in the New York Times, he had an obituary that said he was the inventor of the Ouija board. <gasps> Not true. But I think he maybe tried to sell. Himself. I wonder if the others, the other, his bosses died first and he's like, okay, this is my chance. They can't stop right? me. <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah, I think, I don't know. I don't feel like that was favorable, but whatever. Um, another fun fact, this whole story is full of them. Uh, he ended up dying from a freak accident in one of the factories no. that a Ouija board told him to build. No. He died from a broken rib, which after thinking he would survive, it pierced his heart. What the fuck? Yep. Oh, no. The Ouija board, uh, what did the Ouija board say? Like, build it on this street or, like, well, whatever. You it probably said don't something much more vague. It was like, prepare for big business or something. And so then he <laughs> built this factory. Sounds like a fortune cookie, but okay. <laughs> I mean, no. <laughs> Uh, Allison just texted me and said, find a time to pause recording, please. No toilet paper. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. So this... I'm Now's gonna, the time. I will call it. throw a roll real quick to her. Yeah, this yeah. is what happens when RJ doesn't live here. He can't help anymore. You know what? Good okay. point. Okay, hang on. Hang on. Stand by, everyone. Okay, we're in the clear. Wait, that was so fast. She was coming in as I was coming in. Oh. I think she heard... I think she heard chaos, and she was like, I can get in there. That's very funny. Okay. <laughs> Good um, job. Good job. So before that's so that's eventually that he dies. But uh, in 1898, he ends up getting the rights to no other boards being made outside of the company. So they have full copyright. Um, they have I think he had over 20 copyright and patent registrations. Oh, and wow. He even and he even owned the right to the design of the planchette. Oh, wow. So good for him. Good for him. And now we're going to and then he ended up uh, dying after that. So. Let's now time travel to the 1920s. Let's. And there is a resurgence of spiritualism and thus use of the Ouija board thanks to nearly 800,000 deaths from oh. the Spanish flu and World War I combined. Oof, yikes. Okay. So spiritualism uh, wave two is in full swing mm -hmm. and Ouija boards are more popular than ever. They were even... Uh, Ouija boards had become so influential that authors were now writing books claiming that they were dictated by spirits. Oh my. Okay. Like, and like, th it's so wild now because when you think of today's world versus then spiritualism was just so like, just so normal. Yeah. Like, so normalized that authors could be like, Oh yeah, well this is actually literally one of the uh, author's, wrote a book and said that it was Mark Twain telling her. Oh, story. I've heard about that one. Um, but yeah. so it, it's, it's a literal ghost writer. Like it's like, mm -hmm. Oh, this was <laughs> ghost written, but not, but not how you think. <laughs> That's exactly right. Exactly. Ghost writing. How so, weird is that? Um, there not only, so there was Pearl Curran. Okay. Who wrote works saying that she, it was by a spirit named patience worth. Okay. I think they wrote quite a few things together. And then Emily Grant Hutchings is the one who wrote for The Spirit of Mark Twain. Okay. I think Lore did an episode on that, I'm pretty sure. Mm. I've definitely heard that story. It's very wacky. Uh, super wacky. <laughs> so uh, also at the same time, like, it's not just authors or other influential people who are being driven by Ouija board decisions. There's other people out there who are amateur detectives and they're solving cases with Ouija boards. Oh my. There's men who are joining the military because the Ouija board tells them to. Oh, no, no. There are at least three different people who committed murders because the Ouija board told them okay. to. Okay. All right. Too far, folks. All the way up until the 90s, by the way, in 1994, uh, there was, I think there was one guy who, he was a convicted, he was convicted for murder and he ended up having to get a retrial because they found out in the original trial, the jurors were using a Ouija board <gasps> to determine whether or not he was guilty. Shut up. So like, how fucking stupid is that? It's still abound. And folks. we're talking the 1990s. Yes. 1994. Wow. Okay. Oh my. What? How do you get 12? Okay. Forget it. <laughs> it's just stupid. 
So yeah, or maybe there was 11 and one of them was like, um, I feel like I should report this. I feel like I need to say something. <laughs> that was the one person at my birthday party who was like, I don't mess with spirit boards. Who went upstairs like my mom said I shouldn't play with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, so everyone is just using Ouija boards left and right and it is totally normalized. And it's in my mind, like like dangerous, but kind of cool. And the, like, mm-hmm. it's like, just like fascinating. Yeah. In 1920, the New York Times even wrote in an article that Ouija boards were selling as popular, were as popular of a sell as bubble gum. Holy shit. Okay. Were they still $45 equivalent? Because like. (laughs) That was, that was actually bubble yum. That was (laughs) $46. Okay. That makes more sense. I don't know how much a Ouija board cost at that point, but probably maybe $5. I don't know. Um, (laughs) Good guess. I don't know. It's more than one. I don't know. Uh, so it's now considered at this point because it's just so all over the place. It's not just considered a tool for spiritualism anymore, but it's now becoming a toy used for general mm. entertainment. Also in 1920, the same time that there was an, that mention of bubble gum being as popular, mm-hmm. there was a court case for the Ouija board uh, trying to argue whether or not it was in fact a toy or an instrument for spiritualism. And they wanted it to be a toy so that they could tax it the same as other toys. Okay. That's interesting. And they ended up saying that it was at this point more a toy than a tool because Um. more people were using it for just general entertainment. Wow. Okay. Not only was it a toy for entertainment, but it was also becoming cool with the kids. It was like (laughs) hip hip with the young folk. Uh, so ads started trying to market the Ouija board with slang for Ouija's for Ouija boards. And um, tell me. Um, one ad uh, also in the 1920s was if you call it Ouija or Ouija, it still spells good fun. Uh, which like, I love that even a hundred years ago, people were people having this debate on how to pronounce it. And we still fucking don't. That's a great point. Uh we should mention that the hip term at the time to make it alluring for the young adults was you weren't playing with a Ouija board. You were Ouija-ing. Oh, you were Ouija-ing. Ouija-ing. I was Ouija-ing <laughs> around the corner with my friends. Ooh. Smoking cigarettes and Ouija-ing. <laughs> Ouija-ing. <laughs> um, also, not just making it fun for the younger kids, but for the older kids, it started becoming a way to skirt past dating etiquette and get close to your crush. What? Uh, this is not because... how it worked when I was a teenager, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work for me. I tried. Unless you were dating like the emo kid. Yeah. Like... Well, even that, <laughs> it didn't work for me either. <laughs> so here's why. Because the original instructions told you, well, first of all, you were supposed to touch hands, mm. which at uh, the well, time then. Uh, ooh la la. Forget about it. Forget about it. Uh, So you were allowed to touch the other person's hands for the planchette. Plus, at the time, the board wouldn't always be sat on a table. It would be held in your lap. Your lap. Right. Right. Like So it would be two people sitting across from each other, and it was instructed that you hold it on your lap so your knees are touching. You got a little genital bridge going on. (laughs) 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 A genital bridge? That's going to be the title of this fucking episode I now. Don't why why? I don't know why. that? don't know why. I'm sorry. I forget it. I regret it. I regret every second of it. I'm sorry. Bridging the gap. I'm so Gross. sorry. I regret it. I regret it. <laughs> deeply. Genital bridge. Deeply and heavily. <laughs> I regret it. I'm so sorry. So your knees are touching. I was just going to say like, wow, I can't believe a girl's <laughs> knees were like even being like considered considered as a yeah body part i don't know <laughs> yeah. um but so it was so common that kids were starting to use this as like a way to like do more than the dating etiquette or what right you probably have to turn the lights with. down to like ooh, make it dim and spooky oh yeah make it, yeah get close to each other Hold also hands. i think the original instructions said that it worked best when there was a man and a woman oh, okay the well there you it. go <laughs> i think because it was all sorts of energy out of some bullshit like that you know you know mm-hmm. um so it was so popular that norman rockwell uh he i guess at one point was at a dance and noticed that couples were running off to ouija together Ooh, saucy and s- Instead of dance at the dance, what? they were Ouija. And I guess he made Instead a joke. Instead of sock hopping? 
<laughs> instead of the Charleston. They I don't were know what people did. Yeah. Weejing. They were touching knees and making bridges with their genitals. Ooh la la. I don't know how sexy. Uh, so he, uh, I think he joked to his friend. What was the quote? He said, maybe they can predict what the 20s will bring. <gasps> and this inspired him to do the art for the cover of the Saturday Evening Post for the date of May 1st, 1920. Okay. And it's literally two people ouija together no way. on a date. <gasps> How fun. I want that. That art, by the way, is called Ouija Board, in case anyone wants ouija to look it up. Ouija Board Norman, Nor- Norman Rockwell. I-, I feel like that. <gasps> Em, what a cool picture. I feel like that would be so cool framed in our little pot, in your new troll hole. In my troll hole, we should reenact the picture Actually, and then we get like a yeah. professional picture of us Ouija-ing now with that. our genital bridge. <laughs> <laughs> Remember like two weeks ago when you wouldn't talk about my face rubbing up against yours, but now we're <laughs> r- rubbing genitals or something. <laughs> we're planning our gen- <laughs> Poor Allison's like, uh, seriously, guys, <laughs> I'm right here in the bathroom. My mom has unfortunately cranked the volume up on this episode. <laughs> So uh, in 1927, the uh, Ouija boards made their first million dollars in sales, which wow. is today the equivalent of $16.2 million. Holy shit. Wow. So, and they came out in 1891. So that's nine, it's like what, 36 years it took to get a million dollars in sales. Wow. Um, during the 30s, there the Ouija boards were in even higher demand during the Great Depression for people seeking answers. Oh, that's and sad. then again, and then again in the 40s because of World War II. Okay. Um, the last big surge of the Ouija board was the late 60s, early 70s because of the oh. Vietnam War. It was a lot of a lot of war causes and, and hippies. And hippies. I literally the next thing I had really? was because of the Vietnam War, hippie counterculture, etc. Yeah. Um in 1967, that was the first year when F- William Fold's family ended up selling. This whole time, he's ha- he's been leading Ouija board brands, right? And his family ends up selling to Parker Brothers. Oh, okay. Um, and this is in 1967. Uh, Parker Brothers had they sold two million boards that year, which wow. outsold Monopoly. Wow! 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 Uh, around this time. Uh, oh, by the way, fun fact, Parker Brothers was conveniently based in Salem, Massachusetts, which oh, I love. come on. I didn't know that. Worked out for everyone. <laughs> um, he, so this is where it gets sad for the world of Ouija boards. Do you do you want to take a guess on what killed the love for the Ouija board or the normalization of the Ouija board in our country? Satanic panic? Almost. Oh. That, came, that comes after this. That comes after this. Um, Satanic Panic was the 80s, and this thing happened in 1973. Oh. Oh, I don't. Poltergeist? I have no idea. Close? I don't know. You were on, You were so almost on it. Really? Not, not Poltergeist, but a different movie. Ooh. Exorcism? I mean, The Exorcist. <laughs> yep. Clearly, I've never watched it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and Oh, my every- God. You're kidding. Everyone like had a complete normalcy with the Ouija board from the 1890s all the way until 1973 when the Exorcist came out. So almost a hundred years of people just being like, "This is just something we do." And also, like, think of it was like what? That's almost a century of people just think like normalizing this thing. And I've never heard of a world where it was just normal like that. Totally. For there to be so much fear mongering in today's world, for me to have never even heard of that as a thing people did what wow so anyway wow so and then you're probably right that right after that satanic panic didn't fucking help and people were like you're just talking Mm -hmm. to the devil yep so in 1973 the exorcist came out which was based on quote a true story Mm. where a kid played with a ouija board and became possessed and the story that it was based on by the way was the story of roland doe which was episode Mm -hmm. 23 which was also the episode where you all like to make fun of me for shamelessly flirting with Allison. I didn't know it. Aww. You didn't <sighs> know it. I didn't know it. Everyone else did. You you poor sweet soul knew it <laughs> very well. I cut out. Six hours. Something like that. <laughs> A lot. Aww. So immediately uh, Ouija overnight basically became this evil tool and it got worsened uh in people's eyes due to the recent manson murders Mm. 
due to the rise in the 70s of serial killers. Oh, shit. And satanic panic. Wow. So okay. Wow. Everything just on top of each other. People were like, this shit is demonic. So soon Ouija boards were commonly used uh, on top of everything else in horror films and books. And the end of people loving Ouija boards was now uh, happening everywhere. Wow. So now instead of using them for religious practices, dating games, or daily parlor room fun, <laughs> uh, people were now buying them basically as spooky novelties starting in the 80s. Okay. Okay. Start in 70s, 80s. But after Satanic Panic, that was when they really, I guess, the the rise in them or the resurgence in them spiked. Yeah. Um, I think people kind of left it alone for a while when people were freaked out. And then when the 90s hit, I think it was 91, all of a sudden they were going up again. But now as like spooky tchotchkes. Okay. So the rise in sales since the nineties, uh, that was when like people got really into like paranormal stuff and the occult and people were kind of branching out into more, I think, witchcraft, um, and people who were just enthusiasts about the Ouija board started looking for the graves of Charles Kennard and, mm. uh, Elijah Bond, his lawyer and Helen, and they ended up finding Elijah's unmarked grave. And then they all like rallied together to give him a new grave. <gasps> and it looks like a Ouija board. No way. Mm -hmm. Wow. I am kind of pissed that Helen didn't get that. Yeah, wait or, a like, second. Like, doesn't she be the one who named it Ouija board? Also, really, where's this Ouija girl? Like, why didn't we get her a new Where grave? is she? She's the one I've been wondering about this whole time. They should make her grave look like look like a Ouija board, but call it a Ouija board. A Ouija board. Aww. That'd be fun. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of pushback on Ouija boards today from primarily Christian circles. And also um, M. Schultz. And also me when I'm alone I'm in my saying. own home. I'm just saying. Even to a point where extreme Christian circles were burning Ouija boards with Harry Potter books back in the early 2000s. Okay, well, like, if if they know anything at all, they should know that that's probably going to be worse for you than actually using one is burning one, but whatever. The, well, also, now that I'm reading this, I'm realizing, like, they were having, like, a burn party for Ouija boards and Harry Potter and books. your mother. That was literally my 10th birthday party. <laughs> your mother was like, guess what I found at the local bonfire. I snuck it into the my The Christians trunk. probably heard what my mom was up to and just tried to set everything else on fire. I don't know. So She probably uh, stole it from their fucking burn fire, burn party. I, my mom did say when she was a kid, she used a Ouija board. And she found out that uh, there was a guy named Al who died in her house because he got or was his name Al? It was like Al or Fred or like a, a one syllable name. Mm -hmm. And he got killed in the house with an ax. And oh my God. then she never, she never touched the Ouija board again, but later looked it up and found out that there was actually a guy by that name who died in the house. Dun, dun, dun. So I don't know. She was like, yeah, Ouija boards are fun. Let's have my fifth like, grader do I this. know. Yeah. I was going to say, she's like, I know what would be a great activity. <laughs> Even people today who identify as either mediums or occultists or are in some part of witchcraft, they all have seemingly differing opinions on what to think of Ouija boards. But the main overall opinion seems to be that most people shouldn't use them because most people don't know how to use them or be respectful of the space or the spirits that they might interact with. And as long as you are responsible and cautious and know what you're doing, then it, I think, is okay. Thank I, again, you. It's like, Thank I you, feel like um I feel like everyone has different views. My personal view is like, I just would rather not touch it and find out how bad it could get. Um, My personal view is, um, please. <laughs> Christine's view is taking a wine glass and turning it into a planchette. And Target doesn't sell it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so real quick, the science to Ouija boards Ooh. and why they, uh, the science to Ouija boards basically is the principle called the ide ideometer effect. Well, I don't know. It sounds right okay. to me. I don't know how to, I think I'm saying, I think I'm saying it right. Uh, it's basically the influence of the unconscious mind moving mm. your muscles. You just don't know that you're doing that. Um, so this is a concept that's actually been around since the 1850s. So since spiritualism began, okay, it was even the explanation all the way back then for table turning, but oh. people just ignored it. Um, but here's just a, a common Ouija board experiment as if you were to blindfold people using a Ouija board, you would find out that their messages become much more incoherent because you can't actually see the letters. Yeah. I and read so, about that once and it made me sad. 
So it kind of immediately disproves that you're not in control the whole time, because if you were to blindfold me and use the Ouija board, all of a sudden, nothing would be making sense. Damn. Um, and the more the other psychology to it is the more people that use the board at once becomes a diffusion of responsibility. Right. And so you can kind of even if you accidentally like twisted your hand a weird way or flinched at all, you can kind of be like, oh, well, it wasn't me since we're still moving to different parts of the board. Oh, man. Uh, plus the fact that planchettes are very lightweight and have like those little felted feet. So like it's so easy for them to move like it's you could just barely move or not even realize you're moving and it's sliding all over the yeah, board try my original wine glass I, that was a tough one that I was be. actually we had to like shove it <laughs> <laughs> again exactly so uh so ouija boards are almost a self-fulfilling prophecy because of the ideometer effect because our desire to get proof of spirits convinces us that the spirits are there because we want to see it go so bad that we're subconsciously unconsciously moving around and showing ourselves proof that a spirit exists. But there's got to be an argument that, like, it's it works, right? Like, I'm sure... I mean, I think it's spooky enough that I am... Because I'm prone to believe anything. I I'm know the there's worst still person. debate. Like, I know people still believe that they work. I mean, me being one I, of them. I think they work. Which yeah. is why I'm afraid to touch them. But I literally did all this his all this research to prove that, like, they were a like snake oil salesman yeah, item. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. And I, but I, I still believe that. I'm like, I, I cannot be convinced despite all of the hard I'm facts. one of those like <laughs> woo-woo people who's like, well, you're opening up energy and inviting in a presence to talk to you. And it's like, you know, however you do that. Well, interesting. What if I told you that in 2012, there was a test using Ouija board robots hmm? and they could be on to helping people with neurodegenerative diseases and Alzheimer's. What? So in 2012, the University of British Columbia, there was a study that basically ended up determining people could recall information with more accuracy when using a Ouija board than when not using oh a Ouija gosh. board. Oh my gosh. So uh, I wrote this in shorthand, so bear with me, but participants were asked yes or no trivia questions that you could or could not know was they were kind of challenging questions. If you didn't know the answer, mm -hmm. you know, you weren't expected to ace the test. Uh, you also, so you had to guess yes or no, or answer yes or no for each question. And if you didn't know the answer, you had to also jot down that you were guessing. Mm -hmm. um, the participants were then paired with, to do it a second time, instead of uh, answering these questions by themselves, no Ouija board, or they, they were asking originally, they, these questions without a Ouija board. Mm -hmm. Second time around for this uh, new round of questions, they were going to be playing with a Ouija board with a robot who was basically mimicking another person in a room that they couldn't see. Oh. So it was, it was almost like you were playing Ouija board uh, or you were Ouija-ing <laughs> with someone who wasn't actually in the room with you. You're basically, they, they were kind of I don't know. Are, is it is it clicking? No, I, don't know I know how what you're totally saying. I know what you're saying. Someone else is controlling the other movement, the other per, the yes. robot's movement. Yes. So it, as far as they knew, there was another person in a different room who was playing with the Ouija board with you, but the robot was moving for them. Right. Um, they were told that this robot was just a monitor and should be seen as nothing else other than the person in another room but you just didn't want to be influenced by the other person so they gave you this robot to play with okay they were asked the same questions as they were the first time around and they had to admit whether or not they were guessing uh -huh. for each question they ended up finding out that this robot was not at all monitoring another person's oh. movements in fact, the robot was just enhancing your own movements. Oh, so it was so, like confirming your own. So I if you see. were, if you slightly moved to the left and you didn't even know it, the robot was pushing it left. It's like, let's you. go this way. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in actuality, the robot's movements were just amplifying their own motions, and there was no other person that existed that was helping them. Okay. So, the participants were again, asked the, they had been asked the same questions and they found out the first time around with no Ouija board, when they would guess a question, they were 50% correct mm -hmm. there. They were right half the time. 
when they were playing with the Ouija board and they thought there was another person helping them answer the questions, but it was really just them the whole time, they were actually right 65% of the time. Whoa. So That's uh, weird. Okay. How so then fascinating. To, so then to confirm this even further, uh, these participants were then asked a new set of questions without the board. Right. Um, and they had to let people know whether or not they were guessing on these questions. And then the second time around, they did a Ouija board with an actual person instead of a robot. Right. So now they're playing Ouija board with a new person. What they didn't know was that second person was a plant. Mm -hmm. And when they're playing, uh, when the participants were doing the Ouija board with this plant, they were blindfolded. Okay. So they can't see the board. The plant, the plant is, or the participant is blindfolded. So if you're the, if you're the participant, after you just answer the questions the first time without a board, Mm -hmm. then you answer the questions with the robot. Mm -hmm. Now the third thing is they're asking you brand new questions while you're blindfolded and playing with another person. Got it. Okay. And the other person is a plant. And so since you're blindfolded, what you don't know is when you start playing with the Ouija board, they've taken their hands off the planchette and you're just playing by yourself. Oh, okay. And Basically, they found out the exact same thing, that when they were asked questions before this and they were just asking questions without a Ouija board or a person around, they were about 50 percent correct um, when they were guessing. Mm -hmm. And when the when they thought they were playing Ouija board with somebody else, but they were just playing by themselves blindfolded, they were again only they were right 65 percent of the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, And so basically the results. uh it ended up finding out that people knew more when they felt less in control because oh. if, they thought, if they thought they were being guided by a robot or a person in another room or the person they were playing Ouija board with, somehow they were right more often. That is so even though, interesting. Even though nothing was influencing it besides themselves. It's like psychologically they're backing themselves up and they don't even realize mm-hmm. it. Wow. So one of the quotes from the study was, you do much better with the Ouija on questions that you really don't think you know, but actually something inside of you does know. <sighs> and so this, this, this all, these are all quotes from this study, but this could show a lot about the mind and how it makes decisions below our level of awareness. Mm. And future studies could use the, uh, could use Ouija boards to quote, determine what the non-conscious mind knows, how fast it can learn and how it remembers. Wow. And potentially this, they could also then, if they could harness or learn through this study, how unconscious memory works or when it's able to pop up by itself when you're unaware of using it or accessing it, they could then use this as early indicators of Alzheimer's by letting people use Ouija boards. And if all of a sudden they're not able to recall something, even when using a Ouija board, yeah, it could imply that there's some memory loss before they're even aware of it. What the fuck? Um, and then before I go, I just, I couldn't do Before this you go, <laughs> don't go. <laughs> before I go, there's just one last thing I want to say about the Ouija board, which is that there is, um, it was pretty ripped off from other cultures. So oh, let's. Oh, okay. Wow. Uh, just don't want to not address that. Of course. But the ones I could mainly see were that Rome and were Rome and China. Um, before the Ouija board, there were other similar practices that don't get a lot of recognition. Um, dare I say, we fully ripped them off. Um, so in Rome, there was they would use a board to predict future leaders, and they also used something called augury, which was studying animal behavior to make mm. future decisions. And then in China, up until the Qing Dynasty, uh, people would practice. Some people in a it was called the. I didn't save it, but it was a certain school. But some people practice something called Fuji, which was basically automatic writing with a planchette. Oh, okay, um, okay. Also super gross, but in 1890, when the original Ouija board came out, it was uh, marketed as a, quote, Egyptian luck board. Yikes. Because, quote, Egypt was in vogue in spiritualist Yikes. Cycles. Yikes. So, no thanks. I mean, that doesn't surprise me at all, but yikes. No, but I still wanted to make sure people yeah. do. 
Uh, also today, there are a lot of museums on Ouija boards, especially the Museum of Talking Boards, which I think is in Salem. Um, cool. If it is, I have been there and it was very interesting. It's literally just Ouija boards just from ceiling to floor. Cool. And uh, there's also in my neighborhood, I don't know what the deal is with Burbank, but we are known to have like the most Halloween Mm -hmm. stores per capita or something. Um, Uh, Eva says it is in Salem. Rachel and I went. Okay, cool. All three of y'all went and I haven't gone and I'm so jelly. It's it's literally just a room full of Ouija boards from every era. Um, And but so in my neck of the woods in Burbank, if you ever were to go to the Mystic Museum, they also have Mm. a secondary store called Slashback Video and they have similar Ouija displays of wall to wall Ouija boards. How Um, cool is that? And then I wanted to end on another shout out to Robert Merch at the Talking Board. There he is, Mr. Merch. Historical Society for all of your research. Um, He's chairman of the board to you. I know. And also that was so long and I'm so sorry, but I that. I wanted to fit it all in there, and I that is love it. The history of the Ouija board. Can I do a slight? I hate to say correction, but like question. Yeah. Is it the Qing Dynasty? Like Qing the, Dynasty. Yeah. Okay. Q I N G. Oh, okay. I okay. Okay. Yeah. I just didn't wondering. know how to pronounce it. Um. Wow. And Mr. Yep. Merch, 1992, was like, step aside. I want to write this shit down. <laughs> he was like, someone better figure it out. And I wonder. Like, if, no one's doing it. I wonder if he thought of chairman of the board and was like, well, shit. Now I gotta live up to that <laughs> awesome like, fucking name <laughs> that's how, okay that's how i feel about troll hole right i now. know i, like, I put like, you damn, up to I that i really gotta make this thing like super crazy <laughs> i really like put some pressure on you there i know anyway beautiful there it is. beautiful well um i guess it's my turn to tell you a story yes and i am excited and sad and scared <laughs> As you should, as you well should be. <laughs> um, so this is the story of Nico Jenkins. And it's kind of a random story that I'm pretty sure you probably haven't heard of. I hadn't heard of it. It's it's kind of random. Although there's a weird number of YouTube videos about this. There's a weird number of like, you know, YouTube, crime YouTubers who've covered the story. And I think it's just a very strange mm. one maybe. And that's why. Um, okay. But one of the videos I watched was this uh, woman named Danielle Kirsty, and she does true crime and makeup is like her brand on YouTube. Um, and Seems her, to be a, a thing on YouTube. Right? Of, like, yeah. Murder and makeup. Murder and makeup. I love it. It's so fun to watch. It's so soothing, for lack of a better term. <laughs> um, but she, her video on this had almost a million views. And I was like, shit, that's pretty impressive. So mm-hmm. um <sighs> Here we go. Nico Jenkins. Born September 16th, 1986 in Colorado, uh, he began his criminal activity at a very young age. Um, He was raised in a family of criminals. And according to Omaha, Nebraska's KETV, uh, the extended Jenkins family counts seven felons, including both of his parents, uh, Lori Jenkins and David McGee. So... Fun fact from this uh, YouTuber, this Danielle that I watched on YouTube, um, uh, Nico's great-great-grandfather was Levi Levering, and he was a well-respected tribe leader in, like, the late 1800s in Omaha, Nebraska. Wow. And, weirdly enough, 38 of Levi Levering's descendants are convicted criminals. (gasps) Oh. Right? It's so Interesting. strange. And collectively, these 38 descendants have committed 633 crimes since 1979. Holy shit. So, like, not even that long ago. You know, I mean. What happened? 50 <laughs> years ago. What 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 went down for that to happen? I have no idea. And um, I think she said it in the video, but it's sort of like a nature versus nurture argument that's not sure. neither here nor neither – how do you say that phrase? Neither here. Neither here nor there. There we go. Um, yep. I got the you. jig is up. The gig is up. Whatever. Oh, God. Which one is it? The, the Now you're freaking <laughs> me out. The jig. The jig. The, the jig, is, jig up. is up. And I said the gig. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. I'm never going to know. Um, <laughs> so anyway, this is just kind of the environment that this Nico guy has been raised in. So 
Growing up in Omaha, Nebraska, according to a website that I'm going to mention a lot called criminalbehaviors.com, Nico was in and out of juvie... Uh, juvie state care and mental treatment facilities from a young age he suffered with bedwetting anxiety night terrors due to things he was experiencing at home and he was subsequently removed and put into foster care Uh, his first notable crime was at the age of seven when Mm. he brought a loaded handgun into school yeah oh shit okay no good wow um and when he was eight he was taken to the hospital because he was exerting aggressive behavior and threatening self-harm he spent 11 days in the hospital and a psychiatrist diagnosed him with oppositional defiant disorder and adhd nico would later say that it was around this time he began hearing voices who encouraged him yeah to steal things And along with these voices, uh, he would also see black spirits as well as having recurring nightmares in which his father would shoot his mother. So just a very dark, horrible mindscape for a fucking child. It's terrible. So he was permanently put into foster care after the handgun incident. But at age 11, um, he was acting so violently that he was expelled from his group home. And he was later expelled from multiple schools for the same reason. And once he hit the seventh grade, he just kind of stopped going to school altogether. And he did later get his GED, but that was kind of the end of like his his traditional schooling. Mm-hmm. So at age 13, Nico assaulted someone with a knife. And um, by the time he was 17, he received a total of seven charges, uh, which included arson, assault, theft, unlawful absence, and habitual missing or runaway. And he was put in and out of detention centers and group homes. And then finally, in 2003, he was convicted of robbery and use of a deadly weapon in a carjacking incident and was basically sent to prison for 10 years. And this started in juvie. But by the time he was 19, they transferred him to an adult prison. And so in 2007, he's now in this adult prison. And after an incident involving fighting with other inmates, he was moved into solitary confinement. And now solitary confinement becomes like a horrible pattern or a horrible – it's it's basically like his whole life in prison. There's a – there's a a timeline in the YouTube video I mentioned that Danielle made of um, his time in uh, solitary confinement and you see like the – on a – timeline of years you see like the red marks are all of his solitary confinement and it's like the whole it's like 85 percent of the thing is red (gasps) and it's like oh my god for multiple years at a time back to back to back day to day to day he's in solitary confinement and it's like i don't even agree i don't even agree with solitary confinement for uh, three days let alone like years upon years so i mean we know we know how terrible that is for for a person especially when he he already like walked into jail with so many like mental health concerns already so mentally ill and that's part of the problem too is like he had so many conditions already that like nobody was fucking taking seriously and it Mm -hmm. it just ended it went so bad um and it was like you said he already was diagnosed it's not like it was a mystery like he he, okay okay Yes, I mean like, yes, and then and then throw them into solitary confinement where like no one has gotten As better it, because right, of exactly, solitary confinement. Exactly, exactly. Like, As if that's gonna fucking help, like let yeah. alone make it so much fucking worse. Yeah, exactly. And so, not surprisingly, after being in solitary confinement, uh, he later claimed it led him to experience deep stages of depression, uh, having angry and sad thoughts, a sickness inside of him, and issues with his sanity. Um, And, you know, they've made reports of that for people without mental illness who've gone into solitary confinement and are like, you know, I felt like I was, quote, going crazy or whatever. You know, it's Mm -hmm. not it's not good for the people with the most healthy mental state. I was going to say the the most stable people Mm -hmm. can't tolerate solitary confinement. Yeah, exactly. So when he got out of solitary a month later at this point, he was involved in two gang related fights um, because he, I guess, in his mind had been told to attack innocent people and that's what prompted this um and then he was back in solitary again and um while he was in solitary the second time he started to hear what he called voices of gods including apophis who uh was an egyptian deity um and this voice became more clear around september 2008 uh 
and this deity, this Egyptian uh, deity named Apophis, was also known as the Great Serpent and is sort of seen as the embodiment of chaos, which... Whoa. Whoa. Can you imagine, of all the gods, of to all the gods. Me, that's the one. I'd be like, man, like, couldn't it be the one of peace like, or something? <laughs> like, couldn't it be the one of naps? Like, and, like Dionysus, some wine, some party. Mental health organizations, yeah. <laughs> you know, the goddess of mental health. <laughs> <laughs> yes, precisely. But no, unfortunately, it was the god of chaos. Um, not great. He's also known as the great serpent. Uh, he's also known as the opponent of light and order in the cosmos, which is so like basically everything bad and unruly. Yeah. <laughs> the opponent of peace. Actually. The opponent of peace. So in December, Nico was overheard saying that he desired to kill people. And he was caught on one occasion hiding a weapon he had made, um, basically a shiv. It was a toilet brush that he had sharpened. Mm -hmm. So he was put on psych medications. And um, although he did confirm that it helped with his hallucinations, he often refused to take the medication. So it didn't really regularly work as well as it could have. Um, and so for the rest of his time in prison, he had this kind of volatile up and down behavior. Um, so in December of 2009, he was still in prison, but he was granted furlough to attend his grandmother's funeral. But while he was out for that one day, he ended up assaulting an officer. So, oh God. yeah, basically he got five years added to his sentence for this and all the other behavior Oof. that went wrong during his time and in how, prison. Not that it, I don't know if it matters actually, but like how much time did he have left that he's now added five years onto? That is a good question. Let me see. So he was, uh. This was 2003, so he had four years left um, because oh. he was put in prison in 2003 um, and for 10 years. And then in 2009, so six years into his sentence, Oof. he assaulted an officer. And, and so I don't, I don't know if this added. is – I don't know the – I don't know what it would be like, but I wonder if four years left of a 10 year sentence feels like a lot of time or no time. Yeah. Because you're more than halfway, but also like you'd be like, it's only halfway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I, I wonder if it, because I'm in my mind, I was like, what if you only had like six months left and then he just added right. five years? Well, and you know, I don't know if the five years was added just because of this incident or if it was like everything else mm -hmm. happened and then it was like, you got one year, now you got two years, now you got... I yeah. don't know. I don't know how they added the five years, but, like, after everything that happened, he ended up staying five years longer than wow. he initially was supposed to. Um, which, just spoiler alert, he later said, you should never have let me out of jail. I asked you to not let me out of jail. So oh, this shit. isn't even a thing where he's like, I wish I didn't have to be here. Like, he... And wow. I think that's what's so upsetting, too, about this case is, like, he was so aware of his own mental health issues and like which is no one so took... so interesting yeah and it, yeah and it adds such a like a depth to it and nobody mm -hmm. fucking took him seriously and it's and I, just for a lack of a better word if it, it feels like it makes it more of like a well i don't i don't even i still don't really know how to phrase it but it makes it more human i don't yeah, know for, yeah yeah for for him to be like i'm fully aware of what's going on here and no one's listening to me Ex yeah and it's so fucking tragic and like exactly what you just said of like i know what's going on no one's listening to me is basically ends up that basically ends up being like the whole theme for the rest of the story mm -hmm. um which is terrible because people died and it's like you know they basically and the, also not trying to romanticize like a killer either, that's the, the way, other but. part of this is like it's so hard to tell the story without vic without victimizing the killer but also mm -hmm. you know it, it, that's exactly the thing and like the youtube video i watched too where she was like i i want to be clear i'm not saying you know he's not at fault or whatever but it's also like clearly the system fucked up somewhere yeah. along the way yeah um so yeah there's definitely a weird gray area that's like hard to hit um so anyway with all this going on slightly lighter note in 2010 nico gets married <laughs> to oh it's, um, wedding bells uh he gets married to a woman <laughs> called shalanda in february of 2010 they were both incarcerated at the tecumseh state prison and um congratulations i guess uh yeah. 
And then from 2011 to 2013, Nico was once again placed in solitary. And let me repeat that. From 2011 to 2013, he was placed in solitary confinement. (gasps) Oh, I see. Thank you for repeating because that means two years consecutively. Isn't that rough? 2011, 2012, 2013. So like at least two years. So could be two and a half. Oh my God. And they say like, they say as if I just know like a whole slew of people who've gone through this. But I mean... From the from the very few sources from I've Law ever and Order read, SVU, thir- thirty days in in like the hole is I, like yeah insane. I remember too. when Elliot Stabler went in for a couple days and he about snapped. Oh yeah, remember that? I totally it forgot scared about- me when I was little. When oh, I was yeah, little, he, I was probably like twenty one. He thought he'd been in there for like a certain amount of days, yes. and they're like, "It's only Tuesday it's or only, something." It's only Tuesday. No, but something the, like that. No, one hundred percent. That like struck such a chord with me when I was younger and I don't know. I'm going to go, I'm going to go Google that so I can watch that after we. And I remember him like doing a bunch of push ups and then like. Yeah. Just to like try to stay somewhere <laughs> to in get, his own mind. Yeah. To stay mentally Elliot present. Elliot Stabler, solitary confinement. Okay. Now I know what I'm watching after this. Oh, I'll watch it with you. Okay. <laughs> My favorite. Um, All right. So. He gets married and then he's put into solitary, which sucks because, like, what about your honeymoon? I don't know. But you're in solitary now for two and a half years. <laughs> so that sucks. Um, during this time, this is where, again, it goes back to what you said. During this time, according to criminalbehaviors.com, he repeatedly requested to be transferred to a place where he could receive the appropriate mental health treatment. Hmm. And it's like he kept, he kept asking to be – evaluated he kept saying i have mental like a mental illness i need to be seen by somebody who knows what they're doing a psychiatrist and they just fucking ignored it and it's like they just kept him in solitary awful it's awful so during this time in isolation um according to that same website correctional staff noticed he had violent ideation um including sacrificing children cannibalism and this is Cool, and by cool I mean terrible. Opposite the uh, uh, the opponent of cool, uh, the opponent of cool, the god of chaos. Yeah. Um, which is that a he drank his own urine, which okay we've seen that before, but b <laughs> text message from M Stabler endures solitary confinement law and order SVU on oh, YouTube.com. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, it must have been delayed. <laughs> no, I just it just uh it warmed my heart. Okay. Um, so yeah, he drank his own urine. Okay, one thing. He drank something else from his own what? body of his own body. His semen. semen. Yeah. And he also snorted it. Oh, that's a new one. That's fun. Um, apparently he claimed Why? Apparently he claimed that it was helping boost his like mental wellness, which huh. and in like decreasing his anger, which it's making me think about like all like I mean because I want to be grossed out that he's drinking his own semen, but then I'm like, there's some woman out there, that poor woman who has had to also do it and like <laughs> and like pretend she was having what, fun. What Shalanda, doing it. So, his wife? Yeah, maybe any. I mean, ev- every every person on earth who has done that at a moment of ecstasy. Congratulations. Yeesh. I not like and that's just I that I you know is what? a world I don't understand. So. I'll be honest with you. I had that same thought where I was like, okay, but so many people do that, but for some reason him doing it to himself is it's suddenly weird. so repulsive. But also it's like, but wouldn't it be grosser doing that to somebody else? You know what I mean? Like wouldn't it be grosser to drink someone else's bodily fluid than your own? But for some mm. reason, the thought of him drinking his own semen is so much grosser. I wonder. I don't know. Yeah, I. I'm also trying to want because, yeah, it's for me. It, it doesn't seem gross when someone else is doing it because it's so normalized. And just I guess like, that might be it. Yeah. In in basic sex 101, it seems. But yeah, when when you're doing it to yourself, it's different. Like there's something like there's, extra. Ugh. There's something. I think because it's not supposed to be sexy if it's yours. I don't know. I mean, I Maybe. don't think it's sexy either way. Maybe if you're a dude. I don't know. I don't I don't see how uh, – whatever. I don't know. I'm trying to think also, like, I have heard of, like, the, the benefits of – Ew, semen. really? I know about, like, the ones where, like, if it stays on your skin, it's supposed to be a really good moisturizer. What? 
Yeah. Yeah. Why do I know more about semen than you? I, I, I'm i not surprised because your mother was Linda who was hosting all these fun little that's, parties that's for fair. you. She's I don't probably know. the one who told me about it. Benefits of semen. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see where we end up. It beats depression, number one. Wow. Bullshit. Okay. So, Let me guess. A man wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, maybe. Um, it's good for... Oh, it's good for decreased risk of prostate cancer. Wait, if it, in a it man aids in better sleep, it's you mean if the, a man drinks it himself, right? Like hmm. drinks his partner's or his own benefits of drinking your own semen. I bet there's gonna <laughs> Dear be some God, stuff. I hate that um, my mother-in-law listens to this. <laughs> Fourteen shocking health benefits of drinking. Of swallowing semen. Okay. Gross. Of course, the first picture is like all those little tadpoles. Gross. Um, it's protein rich. Gross. It contains sugar, both fructose and glucose. Yes, sodium, so does cake. Sodium, citrate, zinc, chloride, calcium, lactic acid, magnesium, potassium, and urea, which I think is pee. Uh, oh, God. I'm gonna... It is not highly caloric. So uh, What? It is less acidic than a, a whole list of foods, and it is a mood booster that includes endorphins, prolactin, oxytocin, and serotonin. Bullshit. I don't know if it, that it cancels out if it leaves your body just to go back in your body. Take a but... fucking wheatgrass shot. Stop it. <laughs> don't do this thing that you're doing. Stop it. Some people, some people might be into it. It's certainly not my thing. I'm saying whatever. you can be into it, but don't try to write an article telling me how healthy it is. Are you serious? Like... It does. Come on. It, I would like a nutritionist to back up that article. Like, we all know I, what's going on. It's not like, oh, wow, well, I only did it because I thought I needed a little extra zinc in my diet. It's like, that's bullshit. I am surprised that it's, you know how, like, if you drink your own pee for survival, that it's supposed to be sterile. I would imagine, I guess, well, semen is the exact, it literally carries life. Hmm. Okay, so not sterile. Got it. Hmm. Anyway, continue. We have taken a, a while. It carries time. life and also like STDs. So I, whatever. True. Okay. I don't know. Listen. Depending. Forget it. Okay. So he. So he drinks his own semen. Yeah. That's but, but, but the thing that also that you, you hit on for a minute there with your reaction was he also snorted it, which is like, ouch. That, I got to be honest, is not something I'm okay with. Not, nothing. Don't snort anything. Like, mm, I'm not, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna continue that sentence. But oh, okay. I okay. I was gonna say. I was gonna go into cocaine. I'm like, I don't want to. Like, I don't want to go there. But well, also, I so <laughs> I I hope everyone is on the edge of their seat in discomfort. But <laughs> when if you're not, you're about to be. In my mind, as someone who has never experienced semen in any form, mm. uh, I uh, imagine. <laughs> It is the it is similar to a booger, and so may I? To me, snorting it feels like you are just snorting a booger, like goo, like a, yeah. like a runny, mucusy booger. Yeah, which, like, I honestly, I tr honest and for true, I want to vomit <laughs> just thinking about snorting. Like, a booger. I would imagine it would be like egg whites, like snorting egg whites or something. Uh, you know, that's nasty. Yeah. And it can't feel good. Snorting anything liquid, getting liquid up your nose in general sounds painful as fuck. Like, maybe it's like a really semeny neti pot. I don't know. Oh, a neti pot. Interesting theory. Maybe he filled it an goes entire... in one nostril and out the other. And it takes 10 minutes. <laughs> you just go, wait. <laughs> <laughs> so gross. Gross. Okay, please. Okay, quickly, I'm we so <laughs> sorry. I am. I'm so mad at myself. I'm going to go downstairs while my beautiful infant child and my husband are asleep. And I'm going to look at them and shake my head and think. Your baby was made with semen. No, like, that's not true. <laughs> you don't know that. Okay, you're right. <laughs> okay. So I hate you. All right. Let's go. <laughs> so this is what the uh, – during his time in isolation, correctional staff are witnessing this and being like, uh-oh, okay, things aren't great for this guy. Now, in the month before his release, things kind of shifted. There were no reports of bad behavior nor any reports of mental health concerns. But I'm talking the month before he was released. And mm. basically, he was released July 30th, 2013. And the he had been in – in isolation since 2011. Mm. 
So basically the two years up oh, until... Oh, I forgot that all this semen stuff was happening when he was in like... full isolation. Okay, so honestly, everything I said, like, I am going to take back just because, like, no, it's no true. one's in their right fucking mind. No, 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 it's true. You're you're completely right. It's like, it's, he's just in fucking solitary for years on end, and Ooh. he's diagnosed with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. I, I'm sure there were more uh, things. OCD, ADHD, things that are not being taken care of. oppositional defiant disorder. Exactly. And and on on top of that, he's been in isolation, in solitary confinement for at least two years. And so right before he's released... For whatever reason, a couple weeks before he's out, they're like, oh, no, he's done a 180. And it's like, well, that, that's not how that mm. works. But okay, he's done a 180, I guess. Um, and like I said earlier, spoiler alert, he even said, I should not be released. I am not ready to be released into the world. You should not release me to the public. And Jesus. so on July 30th, they released him uh, to the public. And wow, his family threw him a party at a hotel, like a release party. Mm -hmm. And his uncle gave him a gift for coming out of prison. Do you want to guess what it is? <laughs> no. It's a what big old gun. <gasps> <laughs> oh, I don't know why. I don't know what I thought it was, but it was not a gun. I, wow. interestingly, when I was watching that YouTuber, she was like, and his family gave him, his uncle gave him a present, a really weird present. I went, a gun. And she was like, a shotgun. And I was like, how did I know? Uh, God. Yeah, his uncle gave him also, a shotgun. Also, like, isn't that like, I don't know enough about like the world of like what a criminal is versus a felon versus, but like, isn't there like once you're out of jail, no, he's like, not supposed not allowed to, be, to be, no, no, he's not supposed to be holding. No, okay, no, okay, no. okay. Exactly. Like, he should not be having a shotgun given to him as a gift. I mean, I don't know. This is America. So it's like, who knows what rules are skirted or whatever the fuck. But mm -hmm. yeah, he's given a gun, a shotgun. By his uncle at this hotel party and he and his uh, girlfriend, which I don't know if this girlfriend is different from this wife in prison Oh, okay. because they were in prison together. So I don't know. But it was listed as his girlfriend get into an argument at this party. And that just comes into play later. But so on August 11th, 2013, this is only 12 days after he gets out of prison. He Ugh. commits his first murder. So. Hmm. He and his sister Erica and his cousin Christine decide they are going to go commit a crime. Because again, I don't know what it is about this family, but they just have this. this were, they, were they bored? Was it like I don't just know. a Thursday night? Nothing was on TV? For real. I'm like, they just, it's so strange, but the, they just all happen to be kind of in on it. It's like a family affair. So he and his sister Erica and his cousin Christine decide to go commit a crime. And what they do is they lure 29 year old Jorge uh, Ruiz and 26 year old Juan Pena out to away from a bar, promising to have sex with them. And so they lured them out, and then when they were in this kind of wooded area, Nico jumped out and shot them both in the head with his new shotgun oh. and stole both their wallets. And they were both uh, killed instantly. And it would only be a week later that Nico would strike again. Oh, my God. Yeah, so... Eight days later, on August 19th, he and Erica, his sister, headed to find one of Nico's friends uh, that he had befriended in prison named Curtis Bradford. And Curtis was 22 years old, and Nico referred to him as his little homie. Um, and they were good friends. There were even photos on Facebook of them together hanging out. Um, they looked like pals. But so they went and hung out with Curtis, and Erica just pulled out her gun and shot him. And mm. Nico was pissed. But he wasn't pissed because Erica had shot his friend. He was pissed because he wanted to shoot Curtis. <gasps> so wow. he took out his own gun and said to Erica, this is how you do it, and shot <gasps> Curtis again. Was he alive? With his shotgun. I don't, th I don't know. I don't know. Okay. But after this, he was killed. So <sighs> I don't know if he was killed by the first bullet or not. But basically, he was pissed that his sister shot him before he got a chance to. Interesting that he isn't harming his family. Yeah. Because you would think if you don't really have any feelings towards anyone and you just kind of have like, as he was saying, like this desire to kill. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know where the where the buck stops. So. I don't either. And I don't know where his like how his 
where his thought process goes. Thought process works. Yeah, I have no clue. Um, so Curtis's body was found on August 19th um, outside a detached garage by a man coming home from work. Uh, two days later, Nico struck again. It was sort of like a spree kill. Like it was within a, like a nine or 10 day period that he killed all these people. So on August 21st, um, he struck again. So Lil Wayne was coming to town. <laughs> okay okay wow okay is the context of this story yeah. <laughs> and nico decided this would be a great business opportunity i can rob people leaving the concert oh shit so he and his three of his relatives decided they want to be in on this and they decided they needed a new car to fit in so they decided they would have to steal a car so, wow, just riddled with crime. Just every inch of this. Everybody's in on it. Just come on in. So they went to McDonald's uh, and they scouted out for a car. And in the drive thru, they spotted an SUV that they liked. And they were like, we want that car. So they began to follow it. <sighs> Unfortunately, the car belonged to 33 year old mother of three and bartender Andrea Kruger who was just on her way home from work, picking up some McDonald's. And at a stop sign, Nico and his relatives pulled up, blocked her car. Nico jumped out, pulled Andrea out of her car, and shot her three times in the middle of the road. Oh, my God. It's just heinous. Uh, yeah, then he jumped in her car and drove off. Um, and so neighbors had heard gunshots and called the police. They found Andrea's body in the middle of the road uh, with multiple bullet wounds. Um, she had very much passed away. So at 6.30 p.m. on August 21st, uh, Andrea's SUV was discovered 12 miles away in an alley. There had been an, an attempt to set it on fire, but the attempt was described as feeble. So mm. I think um, from what I remember, the uncle just tried to set it on fire, but not really. Like he like... I don't know, tried to like throw a match at it or whatever. It didn't really work. And they just left yeah. it there. So over the coming days, various bits of evidence began to trickle in as they tried to figure out who the hell killed this woman. Um, investigators did have an image uh, from surveillance of a female uh, at a local gun outlet buying the kind of ammunition that had been used to commit the killings. Um, they'd also found some uh, like street surveillance shots uh along the road where the SUV had been driven. Mm. And while police were trying to piece together not only Andrea's murder, but the other murders as well, the the two people that they had killed near the woods, right. and then Curtis, his friend from prison. Jeez. Uh, All of this, like, within, like, yeah, weeks of like, being out. I think it's, like, nine or ten days. Yeah. So they don't have any clue that it's him at this point. They're trying to figure out all these three separate murders or I guess four technically so then on um august 30th 2013 nico was arrested but not for any of the above murders he was arrested on a completely unrelated terroristic threats charge what okay now this goes back to that hotel party i mentioned the where fight. the fight with his girlfriend exactly okay. where i guess he and his girlfriend got into a fight and then later he threatened her life and he said like the god of the egyptian god will come after you whatever like he he began threatening her and she got scared and she reported this to the police and she took it really seriously and so he was arrested simply on that charge mm. um but because i guess he knew he would be caught eventually when he was arrested for that he just immediately confessed to all four murders oh shit so okay. thankfully they took him in for that because when he was in the interview room, he went on an eight-hour ramble to the cops and confessed to all four uh, murders. Oh, whoa. Although he said it's not his fault. It's the fault of the god Apophis who came to him and ordered him to sacrifice people. And, you know, sometimes I feel like when there's a sentence like that, I get kind of like eye rolly, whatever. But like, it's very clear this man has been is not well, not well. And it's not one of those cases where they're like, feigning, quote unquote, insanity, you know, like, mm -hmm. he's clearly very mentally ill. And mm -hmm. again, that does not excuse any of this behavior, obviously. But at the same time, it's like, uh, you know, it's not as f quote unquote, funny as if somebody 
sure. who were saying, oh, no, I totally, it wasn't me. You know, like, he clearly is like, very. Like, he's not bullshitting. Exactly. Like, he's, yeah. He's not okay. He's, he's not okay. And, like, for all we know, that, he not really that any believes killer this. is okay, but this guy is, like, almost, it's almost not his fault that he is not okay. Yeah. Like, he. If that's, uh, you know, whatever the gray I know, space know. That's of, the thing. That it's, is. like, it's hard to find that line for sure. And whatever the case may be like it can't be denied that he's very mentally ill um Mm -hmm. and so in the run-up to the first murder nico remembered quote my head kept pounding boom 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 and i was like what the fuck is going on and the demonic forces just attacked me i can't sleep 36 hours at a time until i did the first one And Mm. so, um, basically, cops didn't even need to, like, push him for a confession. Like, he gave them all the information they needed. Uh, You can even hear one of the detectives in the interview saying, do you not realize I got Nico Jenkins? I've got you. I've got your DNA at the murder scene. I've got your DNA in the car. I've got the weapon. Um, And he fully admitted. He's like, I shot Juan. I shot Jorge. I took their wallets. He even hand wrote a letter in 2013 where he expressed his wish to plead guilty to all four killings and that he would protect Apophis's kingdom with animalistic savage brutality. Whoa. And I know this is so irrelevant, but they sh- like in that YouTube video I mentioned, they sh- uh, she showed the letter he wrote and he had the most beautiful handwriting. <laughs> oh really i know that's so random but i was like wow wow i was like striking handwriting i was like huh that's interesting because i feel like you see like letters written by serial killers and they always look so scratchy and scary yeah but he had just beautiful handwriting i know that's like so not relevant but i just it struck me you know the point one percent of something not horrible about this (laughs) yeah right exactly you're you're finding the silver lining wherever you can thank you you know how i feel about fonts i was like i I know you love a good font i love a good font i'm just it was it was touching to me um so anyway He wrote another letter also uh, where he wrote about the chemistry of the mind and body, biochemicals, formulas, activities of the brain and pituitary glands and surgically implanted devices. I mean, this is, you know, his schizophrenia playing out, according to psychiatrists, like he's very much not well, but he's writing these letters and he's uh, petitioning for his own case. I'm not really sure what he's after, but at this point, Mm -hmm. that's what they're getting. Um, And during his hearing... This is not great. He was reported to have laughed as they detailed the victim's deaths. Um, And so when uh, the Douglas County attorney, Don Klein, outlined how uh, Nico's sister had shot Curtis Bradford and then Nico had said, like, this is how you do it and shot Curtis again himself because he wanted to do it. Jenkins or Nico scoffed and said, you're lying. Dude is crazy. And then continued by claiming to not remember any of the killings and that this was all puzzling because Curtis was my homie. And so I would never do a thing like this. Oh, so just all over the place. Um, He also claimed that commanding voices clouded his memory of all the killings Uh, phrases uh, that the voices whispered to him included kill them, destroy them, attack them. And um, he later actually tattooed those phrases onto his own face. So we'll get there. Okay. Uh, He told the court that Apophis and Lucifer told him that the people he murdered were attempting to kill him. So he killed them under orders. Whoa. And yeah. Hey, Lucifer of all of them. Of all of them. You know, and it's it's, it's hard to tell this too because, you know, like I know people who – suffer from schizophrenia and and like i hate to paint it as like oh well he was schizophrenic and so he was on a murder spree you know and it's hard to like tell the story without it sounding like those were inextricably linked like you know he had this mental illness schizophrenic people yeah you you can't escape killing yeah Yeah, like oh of course he murdered people he had Mm -hmm. voices you know and i'm not trying to at all make it that way and i want to be clear too that's not That's not what I'm trying to say. Um, But clearly, you know, he needed a lot of help. He went through a lot in his childhood. He went, whatever it may be, he was committing these crimes and nobody was taking his mental illness seriously. Um, When the judge strongly suggested that he get an attorney for his death penalty hearing, because after, you know, he had a separate death penalty hearing, 
Um, he said, first of all, that he would like to waive his president, his president, he would like to waive his presence and be notified through letter, like mm-hmm. through the post. Like he, he didn't want to be there. He's like, just somebody write me a letter and tell me. And they're like, no, yeah. you, you got to be there. Like, uh, we know how bad it's going to be. I, I already have a hunch. <laughs> yeah. I don't feel great about it. Write me and I'll be in Bermuda. Send me a letter. Yeah. Um, and then he's like, oh, by the way, can you just take the death penalty off the table? And they're like. No, sorry. Uh, yeah. Can't. Unfortunately, you've given us some eligible reasons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, so, so be it, worried. <laughs> if anyone's going to do it, it's us. Um, and so when the judge was like, you should get an attorney to represent you at this hearing, he replied, that's only if I care about it. Uh, mm. And I guess not, because he decided to represent himself, which legally he is allowed to do. Um. And although he had confessed to the murders already, unfortunately, the trial was not as straightforward as hoped. Um, According to Omaha.com, Nico began speaking in tongues, which he claimed was the language of um, his, you know, serpent god. He Mm. smirked and laughed as uh, prosecutors recounted details of his victim's death. He pleaded guilty, but then refused to accept the prosecutor's accounts of the shootings. Then he pleaded no contest, and a judge found him guilty. Um, And then he blamed the Nebraska prison system for the deaths of the four victims because they said – because he said they released him despite his schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. Um, He said he wanted to go to death row. Then he asked the – Don Klein, the attorney, to take the death penalty off the table then he said he would never hurt a woman unless Apophis commanded him to. Uh, then he said they it's were all, all over the place. It, all over the place. He said they were human sacrifices. He was just a vessel, et cetera, et cetera. Oof. So uh, if you're like, you know, what I was saying earlier, like, is this an act or not? Um, his wife, Shalanda, said he's not pretending to be, be crazy. Uh Nico specifically told me that Apophis gives him orders. It was this voice that came and was just like, if you do what I tell you to do, if you follow my demands, then I'll make sure you're safe and I'll make sure you're okay. Um, So his wife was like, this is not an act. Like, this is really what's happening in his mind. Um, So on April 16, 2014, he was found guilty for the murder of Juan and Jorge, Curtis Bradford, and Andrea Kruger. So all four of his victims, he was found guilty. According to the Daily Mail, a psychiatrist um, for the prison system testified that uh, he was a psychopath and one of the most dangerous people I've ever evaluated. Oh, well, I mean, I'm not surprised. I know. It's geez. like it's hard to be surprised at this point. So this is where it gets kind of wacky. Um <laughs> Wacky may not be the right word, but in April 2015, Nico attempted to carve. This is when he starts kind of self-mutilating. Uh So he attempted to carve the number 666 into his forehead. Um, Unfortunately, he was looking into a mirror, so it said 999. (laughs) Are you serious? (laughs) Oh, my God. That happened with my... um, With what? (laughs) (laughs) With what? (laughs) What did you do? My my ex-brother, my my ex-stepdad's kid uh he used to be my stepbrother he we all went out on a family trip one time with his friends and they got really like super duper hammered this is when like i think he had just turned 21 so Uh he he was invincible on alcohol and he wanted to brand himself (gasps) with the the letter of his last name like the the first initial of his last name which was uh an f and he did it backwards (laughs) Because he was looking in the mirror. Because he did it on himself with a knife. He like heated up a knife. Shut like the, up. Like a, like a dull butter knife. But heated it up and then branded himself three times. And then when he looked later, it was backwards because he oh, did it in the mirror. Dear <laughs> God. I mean, yeah. that'll tell so you. It, like, it happens. It ended up being, the, it ended up being the, the talk of the rest of the vacation being like, let's look at your stupid fucking Show arm. Show me your brand. <laughs> oh, yikes. Of all Ugh. things, an F backwards. Oh, imagine ouch. if he had done it like 
the long part of the F and then he did the first horizontal one and he realized it was backwards. And then he was like, either I commit or I like, like, what do I do now? Start over. Yeah. You're kind of fucked at that point. Or you make it a different letter, make it a a blocky A. (laughs) Make it a different symbol. (laughs) Anyway. Uh, Yeah. So he wrote 999 on his own forehead. So that's It happens to the best of us. It happens. Um, And then a month later, he cut the word Satan into his face. Oh, okay. And then he just, it gets worse. He decided he wanted to resemble his god, Apophis. So he cut his tongue to be <sighs> like a snake. <sighs> and Oof. it required, I think, 13 stitches. And then in September of 2015, he uh, told the judge he was listening to the voice of Apophis when he attempted to cut his penis into the shape of a serpent. Sure. And this did enough damage to require 27 stitches. On his wee-wee. Ugh. Sure. So he was sentenced to death Ugh. in May 2017 by a three-judge panel. But fortunately for him, Nebraska abolished capital punishment in 2015. However, as AP News reports, death penalty supporters responded with a statewide ballot campaign that prevented the law from going into effect until voters decided whether to overturn the decision. So nearly 61% of voters opted to reinstate the death penalty. And so Nika, I mean, I'll be very blunt and upfront here. I'm very against the death penalty, but whatever. So apparently um, 61% of people in nebraska voted to reinstate it and so nico jenkins has been given nebraska's first death sentence since the punishment has been reinstated whoa so apparently from anything i can find he's still on death row he's still in the tecumseh state correctional institution um he's made a few attempts at suicide which have landed him in medical wards and his attorney has stated you can't execute people who are mentally ill and i would argue this man was very mentally ill i would argue you can but you shouldn't like i agree you shouldn't but like i wouldn't say you can't because i'm sure it's happened before and it'll happen again unfortunately um nico also has a new fiance because he and shalana broke up um And this is a 46-year-old woman from Texas called Dawn Argello, uh, whom he met when she was doing volunteer work with death row inmates. Mm. And he tattooed her name onto his face. I don't okay. know if it was backwards, which I guess would be like... Right. Wad. <laughs> I don't know. Oh my God. Nod. Wad. Uh, <laughs> Wad. Wad. <laughs> but apparently Dawn was like pissed. She was like... She literally said, I was very ticked off that he did that. He doesn't need to be self-mutilating like that. So she was like, don't fucking carve my name into your face. Fair enough. Um, So far, I like her. I mean, I get it. So Nico's sister, Erica, is also serving a life sentence because she murdered Curtis Bradford. And uh, apparently she and his cousin, Christine, do you remember Christine, who the two of them like Mm -hmm. lured those men? So apparently they were both sent to prison, but Christine had testified against the whole family to get a lighter sentence. But Mm. then they put Erica and Christine in the same fucking prison cell. (gasps) And so Erica tried to kill her for, for ratting her out. Yeah. And which is like. You got to believe they knew what they were doing when they put them in the same fucking cell. Like, yeah, she clearly got a lighter sentence by like ratting everyone else out. Then they put them in the same fucking cell and Erica almost killed Christine. Um, So anyway, apparently Erica's latest endeavor is that she petitioned the court for a name change. Uh, her name was Erica Jenkins and now she wants it to be Illuminati with an E. Illuminati. Girl, e- what? I know. It gets worse. Okay. Illuminati, e goddess, so goddess with an e at the front. Oh, uh huh. Erica with two k's, prestige. Illuminati, e goddess, Erica, prestige is what she's princess pe- Consuela. Banana. <laughs> yes, yes, is uh, what she's petitioning. I'm sorry, goddess, princess Consuela. Banana. <laughs> banana I make. Um, so unfortunately, there's not much we know about the victims of Nico Jenkins and his family, especially Juan and Jorge. We don't know too much about them. But Curtis Bradford is survived by his mother, Valida Glasgow, and Andrea Kruger uh, is survived by her children, Jaden, Ava, and Hartley, and her husband, Michael Ryan. And that is the story of Nico Jenkins. Whoa. Wham, bam, thank one. you, ma'am. That's it's 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 rough because it's like. 
wow, he carved 999 in his face. Ha ha. But then it's like nobody was so mentally ill and no one fucking took him seriously. And Mm -hmm. he and that's the frustrating thing that you mentioned. Like he even said, I should not be released. And it's like, how does that get past people? It's also it's such an awkward gray space because you don't at all want to feel bad for someone who's done such horrible things. But then like somehow a part of me can like separate it just to be like wow like that guy needed real real fucking help real but help then it's but then i bounce back quickly and be like oh well look at all the shit and if i were any, andrea's kid you know? i'd be like why are you giving him you know mm-hmm. the grace whatever you know but yeah so it's it is a very weird gray space um and it's it's pretty pretty shitty and pretty heavy and it just goes to show you know (laughs) mental illness is not taken as seriously as it should be amen that's Uh, definitely an extreme example but extreme very very true example indeed well what are you what are you doing after this what are you doing i don't know what am i doing um i'm pouring more wine my baby's apparently (laughs) sleeping blaze says so i probably woke her up when i screamed one of those many times but um yeah how well can you give everyone an update on the sleeping situation oh it's bad (laughs) oh really well she turned five months uh today or yesterday march 1st Yay. yay five months old so apparently her four month sleep regression might be ending soon fingers crossed i don't know we're moving her into her own room and her own crib soon and is that is five months the normal age for that um yeah usually around like five or six well i don't know it depends some people wait over a year some people wait till six months i don't know but she's in like a snoo bassinet that the robot thing that moves and six months is the maximum to keep them in that and she's now over five months so we're gonna try to move her to her own room and she's gonna start eating solids in a few weeks just (gasps) just like a little bit at a time like little when can funkalem give her a little milkshake (laughs) wait can we give her milkshake with your breast milk (laughs) ew (laughs) i don't know it feels more baby themed that way just a baby themed milkshake Mm. (laughs) (laughs) gross gross you said it is that what happened something happened where your breast milk was in the freezer and i was like is there isn't an ice cream Here's the thing. I went to L.A. to do some work for like 48 hours and I brought it was my first trip away from home and I brought my breast pump and poor M had to witness me while we were on location working somewhere outside of our home. And I was like, I got to pump. <laughs> so I sat in the courtyard and pumped. And then my dumb ass had a flight at I had to get up at 3.30 in the morning and I forgot to put the fucking ice packs in the freezer. So I was like, I got to leave all this breast milk in the freezer. And since we have this in this way drink apartment, of course, it was all there. So then the next day, I was like, Christine, I went to go get some ice cream from the freezer. And all I found was just packs of your breast milk. And I was like, can I or can I not? Yeah. Does I it, won't. Does, but, can, but in but theory, could, could I, I or could I not? Or should I or could I Is not? Is it ice cream? And would it be enjoyable? What is it? Tell me I, what's the what's where where do hmm, we stand? How what's, blurred are our lines at this point? Where's the gray space? <laughs> oh my god! And I was like, back away, back away. Okay, bottom line, I did not eat your breast milk. Thank you. I did. I am upset though that I still haven't gotten a clear answer on whether or not that is technically ice cream. The answer is like no, because I feel like, like if you just pour milk into a cup and put it in the freezer, that's also not ice cream. Hmm. you know now i have to figure out this the ingredients of ice cream and like if i put something else in with sugar your milk. and then i feel like you got to just like put it in one of those ice cream makers that makes it super cold kick it around in one of those like ice cream soccer balls yeah mm-hmm. okay that'll make it ice cream just like shake weight st- it i'm not gonna eat it i just i just want the information okay yeah i mean listen everyone's judging you i'm not it's still sitting there untouched. I didn't even touch the packaging. I honestly, it freaked me out a little bit. And of, but cor- I, of course it was because it literally was like sharpied with like my handwriting on it. Like it was really nuts. But Blaze was like, just throw it away because you're not going to use it. I'm like, I'll fly back and get it. And he's like, you're going to fly back and get it. And I was like, I don't know. Maybe. Is it? Should I throw it away? No, I'll come get it. <laughs> what's wrong with you? Don't text Blaze. He's going to be like, away. no, because I'll go get it. It's fine. Okay. It's sure. hard to throw away because it's like it takes so it's much work your body. to get it. No, it's just like it takes so much work. Is it like is she allowed to drink it now at this point though? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. 
I'm All just right, saying I, I wish I had brought it back, but I couldn't because I forgot. Whatever. If I don't if I don't come back in the next month or two, we can toss it. Okay. But I won't Good make you do it. I'll I'll do it. I'll pick time. it up. It's fine. It's fine. It's in a bag. It's fine. It's if it bag. leaks on me, I'll vomit for sure. Oh my and god! It's for no frozen. reason except to be dramatic. So on the one hand, I was like, if it leaks on me, I'll vomit. But then it's like, can I please eat it? I'm like, make up your I'm fucking eat it. mind. I'm not gonna eat it. I just want to know, like, what's no, it's the not ice of- cream, Emma Fee. If that's okay. the que- if that's the only question, no, because like well, we'll never know. We'll never know. Oh, we'll. Ne- I guess nobody will we'll, ever. know. We will think about it, but we'll never know. We'll all ponder the possibility. <laughs> All right. Uh, anyway, oh, I guess it's God. time for me to go and scream into a pillow or something. Really? Because so, I think maybe me too. <laughs> I appreciate you as you're Do a great you? storyteller. Do you? And I, I, I don't know. I don't know how to end this. Maybe return. we, tell, maybe, tell, may, tell a joke. Okay. Maybe we finally found our, and remember how we always struggle to end it. Maybe it's just like a breast milk update. Everyone's like, no, 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 no. Don't do that. <laughs> it's um, still sitting there. <laughs> Um, what's the status? <laughs> I'm not going to do anything with it. I just, I okay. It doesn't matter. Goodbye, everybody. And we love you. And, uh, that's why we drink <laughs> breast milk. <laughs> <laughs>